March 16th meeting of the Nevada City Planning Commission. We're called to order. Um, this Planning Commission meeting convenes on the ancestral territories of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon Tribe. Um, would you like to lead us sure. in the yep. Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Ermshar. Present. Commissioner Brown. Here. Commissioner Van Zant. Here. And Vice Chair Cobden is not here yet. Oh, she's here. <laughs> Commissioner Cobden, are you present? <laughs> uh, Chair Nye. Here. All right. Um, time for hearing from the public. Um, public comment for items not on the agenda are welcome at this time. They are limited to three minutes, and no action or discussion by the commission uh, may occur at this time. So any public commenters for items not on the agenda in the House? Anyone online? We have nobody online. Yeah. Uh, for the consent calendar, all, all items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine in nature and, and all recommended actions of the staff report will be approved by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the commission or public requests otherwise, in which case the item will be, re be removed for separate consideration. Any item so removed will be taken up following the motion to approve the consent agenda. So does anyone who pulled want to pull the, the one item out of the consent agenda, um, which is the uh, approval of the February 16th, 23 meeting minutes. Um, anyone have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve. Second. I would second it. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So passes, five to zero. Uh, next up, historic district sign. At 426 Broad Street. We New skipped the presentation, actually. Oh, oh, I didn't see <laughs> Sorry, it on the I agenda. I snuck it in between there. <laughs> okay, oh, I, did, yeah. I didn't see it. We, do we have a presentation? Yeah. <laughs> we do indeed. A 45 minute presentation. <laughs> right. Been waiting all day for a presentation. Uh, we have Andy Cassano here, who is a planner at the Nevada City Engineering, mm -hmm. and he actually did planning work for the city back in the early 90s. And he's going to present about Nevada County. Um, planning history. I'm going to pull up the slides here. And always, always curious about context. I'm eager to hear and what precipitated this presentation. Is there anything so specific? What precipitated this was that our city manager was at the NCCLI, um, I guess it was, a, it was the planning day, and they, um, he did this presentation there and he thought it was great and cool. said, suggested that, the, that he do it for the planning commission. Thanks. Welcome, Andy. Thank you very much. And you can you can be at the at the lectern or podium, whichever we want to call it, he, or the chair. He wants to be able to advance the slides himself. Okay. Just for those who don't know, NCCLI is the Nevada County Community Leadership Institute. Yeah, this show was um, started as part of a day of instruction at the Leadership Institute for planning and the environment. And uh, I was a co-chair for several years. <clears throat> and it seemed important to give the class, first of all, some examples of what planning means and what has happened over a period of time in our community re res with respect to planning. And then this helped them to understand what planning is because like so many people, uh, their grasp of planning is that when they saw, see trees falling and bulldozers show up, they go, hey, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> you know, and us planners, we like to be in on it a little bit earlier and maybe put our fingerprints on it a little bit. So I've always been interested in it. I just finished my 54th year in my career, most of which has involved planning, and I actually was uh, Nevada City's first city planner. They were doing planning work before, but it was more or less the city manager and uh, Lon Cooper, who was a longtime 
volunteer. And when was that? If we, can we just jump in? When was that? Sure. That was uh, 1984. And the reason I was hired is that Grass Valley Group wanted to build in um, Nevada City. And the city council and uh, management thought that probably a professional planner uh, overseeing that process would be a good idea so that wasn't messed up. So I didn't trip over the cord. I know. So I so far it. so good. <laughs> Does this just start to uh, start to slide? Should, so, so it looks a little different out here than here, but what's what's showing and what's recording, but you can just um, advance it with uh, these and go back with that. Okay. okay, I forgot to put in here where you had to do PowerPoints. It's in the history <laughs> somewhere back there. I will, one disclaimer is possibly um, Commissioner Van Zandt is the one person here that can jump up at some point and call me a liar, and you're more than welcome to do that, but th this is the way I remember it, so uh, we'll go from there. I'm trying, to, <laughs> I'm trying to outlive all the people that can refute my recollection. <laughs> so, before the gold rush, you know, we have a little, um, you have a little acknowledgement on your agenda every week that these are the historical lands of the Nisanan people. So, just think about it, maybe 10,000 years back, these Native American people lived here and uh, hunted and gathered and probably uh, argued over territory a little bit, but otherwise life was pretty simple until the gold rush came. And there was no EIR, as it turns out, for the gold rush. So just a huge mess where this territory, the Mother Lode region, was overrun with people wanting to get rich quick, and Native American people were just in the way, so they had to go. and. At one time, uh, there was even a bounty on the heads of Indian people in Marysville because they were such a pest with respect to the extraction of gold. So really between 1849 and 1860, or 1960, mining, underground Sorry. mining, decade after decade after day after day, starting out with seven, uh, the average worker was seven 12-hour shifts every week. And slowly over time, they got a few more benefits, maybe even Sunday off in the later years. But the amount of work and employment and everything that went into mining over those decades is hard to really explain. Um, all of the downtown buildings, all of the old beautiful houses, they're all really a product of gold mining in this area. It's interesting to me that now um, we seem almost on the verge of making gold mining outlawed. So it's um, something that, as I continue to monitor the history of planning, I'm paying attention to. What did, did I do something? No, I, it's, uh, it's not the, I think it was on a different shared screen. Okay. I must have had a couple PowerPoints open. Hold on, I'm gonna, sorry to do this. I'm gonna close right. this, sorry. So, there was a lot of timber used too, you know. The mines ran for a long time on steam power, so you'll see old pictures of Grass Valley and Nevada City that are practically bare of any trees. Trees were used for lumber and they were used to fire the uh, boilers. The Idaho, Maryland mine was going through 35 cords of wood a day at one point to run the steam engines to run the mine. Um, in the mid 50s, the last major gold mine in our area closed. It was the Empire Mine. And uh, overnight, 800 men, mostly men, were out of work. My uh, friend Ray Shine told me that as a second grader in Hennessy School in Grass Valley, he and one other guy had employed dads. Everybody else was out of work. Now this you can, and, and the size of the county then was about 20,000, so it was a huge deal to lose that much. The downtowns were sold shoes and clothes and goods and services to the people that were miners and their families. Um, so that kind of led to one thing that happened in Nevada City is there were a lot of vacant storefronts after that and a lot of unemployment, and the city fathers were concerned about, um, you know, what was going to happen to downtown. And there had been, some of them had been back east to see restored communities. Thank you. Restored communities, and they wondered if uh, maybe 
trying to freeze Nevada City in the gold rush era might be a strategy to bring some energy and life into the downtown. So in 1968, they uh, signed the historical district ordinance. Now this was big in those days because the government didn't mess with property rights much in those days. Zoning and building permits had only started in the early 60s here. So it was generally referred to as the hysterical district ordinance. And there was a lot of outrage from property owners that they could no longer tear down their brick building and build something, you know, modern. But the city council stuck with their guns and they had a sunset clause to take down signs and that type of thing. And um, man, was that a visionary thing to do. When I was city planner starting in 84, I would still get calls from different places across the country. Can we get a copy of that historical district ordinance? Because, yeah, we're thinking about maybe doing something like that. So the county wasn't growing that much, but one thing that happened that helped the economy quite a bit is a ton of federal money came into this area. I don't know why they had so much money, but Golden Center Freeway, mostly federal funding, uh, Glenbrook sewer project, the whole Glenbrook area was on septic tanks and real high groundwater and it was a mess. So sewers were put into there. That's when I started my career doing easement maps for Glenbrook. NID uh, Yuba Bear Project, um, I think that built Camp Far West and Rollins Reservoir. Um, Bullard, New Bullard's Bar Dam up in my neighborhood at Camptonville. And uh, logging and lumber was really flourishing when I was a kid. That's what supported everybody. Um, your dad worked in the sawmill or in the woods or he drove a lumber truck or a logging truck. In the 1960s, why recreational, so-called recreational subdivisions came along and the uh, developers said, well, these things, these are not like real homes. These are going to be vacation homes, so somebody's going to buy a lot in Lake Wildwood and maybe put up a little A-frame and they'll come a couple weeks out of the year and uh, have a picnic with their family and everything, it's going to be great. So Alta Sierra, Lake of the Pines, Cascade Shores, Lake Wildwood, and on the east side, Tahoe Donner, were all kind of approved that way. And they went through relatively easy. I wasn't in the meetings where they were approved, but I don't think it was all that difficult to get those approved. And certainly not a lot of uh, thought went into each lot. Andy, I'm sorry, are you, I'm confused. Uh, were these meetings happening in the 80s or the 60s? 60s. Okay. So you weren't in those meetings because you were no. No, I was. Uh, at that point. I was a happy little teenager, and yeah. Just making it clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these guys were advertising in the Bay Area and Southern California, and people were coming to town to look at land. So it started the four by four era. So maybe I would buy a piece of land. I would divide it into four parcels, which I could do in about a week, and um, and then I would sell one to each of you, four of you, and then you would come in and you would divide your part into four pieces. And there's really no thought that went into these for most of the time as far as access or uh, sewer, uh, sewer capability or anything like that. Um, so a lot of lots were made that way. So the Golden Center Freeway was completed. It um, divided the town, towns, took out a lot of community. So I give the best planning award to the 1960s for the historical district ordinance. Far and away, the smartest thing that was ever done in the 60s. And has paid off even today. And here you are as the conservators of the district now. So the 1970s, uh, that's when I was starting my career. And man alive, the county grew, doubled in population. Fastest growing county in California. Um, these subdivisions turned out they weren't, they, they weren't just recreational subdivisions. They weren't just for weekenders. People moved in permanently and a lot of people 
kind of young retired people came here, maybe in their 50s and such. And, you know, in the um, hippie movement, there was kind of a back to land feeling too, that your real, what you really needed to do is to own some land that you could be self-sufficient on. So this growth was an industry in itself, you know, it takes a lot of, makes a lot of jobs to double the population, builders and engineering, realtors and so on. But there was this little company that started in the 60s called Grass Valley Group. And nobody really knew what it was about. Um, but one thing that started to happen is, you know, before Grass Valley Group in this area, why predominantly men went to work. They took the family one car and they went to work and then they came home and mom stayed home and she uh, had cookies and milk for the kids when they came home from school and uh, or maybe she'd walk down to the neighborhood market of which were all mostly in walking distance and get the groceries or in some cases especially in Camptonville maybe send the kid down with a note to sell him cigarettes and a bottle of whiskey and uh, <laughs> go home from there. Now all of a sudden what happened is the Grass Valley Group was doing circuit board assembly and what really, the people that really worked good on that were the housewives and the ladies of the house. So a lot of the ladies that went to work there, now they needed a second car. And then in the meantime, you know, TV was starting and it sort of started this keep up with the Joneses growth and really sort of changed everything. Um, tourism was starting to grow too, thanks in part to Nevada City's historical district ordinance. In 1975, the county had, a, had enough money to do a special census. You know, federally we do the census every 10 years. <clears throat> but in 1975, they decided to do their own census. So they did, and along with the counting of the people, why they uh, put in some questions about what people wanted to see in the community. And one huge um, thing that came out of the 75 census is, we want shopping centers. We have to have shopping centers. Now think about it before then, why there was Mill Street and Main Street and Broad Street and Commercial Street and a few businesses in between the two towns, but that was it. So people then were going down the hill and they thought we should have some suburban shopping centers. So the county, who just uh, still owned or still oversaw Glenbrook, and now it had public sewer, uh, zone most of the Glenbrook Basin commercial in response to that 1975 census. And so sh the shopping centers that you see today started to spring up. For people like me, the California Environmental <coughs> Quality Act came along and suddenly we were supposed to think about these four-way divisions and these subdivisions and like, you know, like county, what business is it of yours? Well, th this new law is that we have to think about it. We're supposed to look before we leap. We're supposed to think about how things are going to affect us before we do it. And so we all got kind of used to this, uh, this new law, the California Environmental Quality Act. Because the growth was so rampant, there was a lot of debate about growth. You know, the, the, um, we used to say that, that if you came to live in Nevada County, you wanted the gate closed at the Bear River right after you came through so that you would be the last one. And, uh, and oh my God, if we don't get a grip on this, we're going to turn into San Jose or, you know, whatever place I came from that got ruined. I don't want that to happen here. It's too good here. It's too pretty here. So there were measures on the ballot, um, measures A and B that had to do with growth control, and there were terrible campaigns and debates about those. They were both narrowly defeated. I'd have to give the best planning of the 70s to CEQA. It really needs work. It's not good. It's abused. Um, I hear the legislatures thinking about working on it, but I'm not real optimistic because there's clashes and different interests every time there's talk of working on CEQA. In the 1980s, it was only 50% growth, but that basically meant another 25,000 people or more came, came here. So the growth itself was an industry, logging continued. Uh, logging was starting to decrease in part because of lawsuits over timber harvest plans. Grass Valley Group moved to Nevada City, and that's when I came to work as Nevada City Planner. 
The county adopted a new general plan that was based on constraints and capabilities. Imagine that. They put, if you're right next to community services and a fire station, you've got smaller minimum lot sizes, three and five acre minimums. If you're way out in the boondocks, you've got 40 acre, you know, larger parcel sizes. And uh, it, was, it was difficult because people had to uh, get used to the idea that the zone, you were being down zoned from what was otherwise capable. Kmart and SPD were built in during that time, and there was no public hearing. They just went down to City Hall and got a building permit. Um, Nevada City adopted a general plan. Uh, before Grass Valley Group came along, there had been a, the City Council had approved a housing project called Champion Trails for that same area out there that's now the Tech Center. And uh, the council approved it, but there was a referendum and the voters turned it down. And right after that, uh, Grass Valley Group realized it was a good site for them and they moved in to get approved there. Pine Creek Center was under debate. This is the Rayleigh's Penny's shopping center in Grass Valley. And these were kind of sloping pine-filled hillsides and there was a lot of debate about it. And, the Mill Street people came in and said, oh my God, you're going to ruin our business if we, if this shopping center goes in, you're killing Mill Street for, for good. And then there was beautiful timber out there and there was a lot of trees that people were concerned about. And then one weekend, all the trees were gone. So I went down the road on a Monday morning and went, what the hell, man, all those trees are gone. They had a timber harvest plan that was perfectly legal, but that took the tree debate right off the table one way to do it. Now, shortly after that, four, four of the five council members were recalled in Grass Valley. Now, I always thought it was from, because of the Pine Creek Center uh, approval, which still I have friends calling it Pineless Creekless, by the way. Um, Howard Levine, my friend that was so active in Grass Valley, says, no, they fired a popular police chief. They fired a police chief that everybody liked. That's why they got recalled, so. I don't know, might have been about the time Peter was coming here, so I'm not sure he can weigh in. Mm -hmm. Whispering Pines <clears throat> Business Park was approved, but it was a struggle, a lot of opposition to it. And uh, of course, Whispering Pines is still a good business park, but it was really overestimated how fast it would fill up with new businesses, and there's still a lot of vacant lots there. I think the Nevada County General Plan was the best thing that happened in the 80s. Uh, it really started to make people think in terms of capability and constraint of the community and where growth should occur and where it shouldn't occur. 1990s, the growth showed down, slowed down a bit, but it was still going. The last major sawmill in uh, the area, a Bohemia Sawmill on Brunswick Road, closed and 125 mill workers no longer were welcome here with their profession. Um, retirement income was doing okay. Diversification, you know, Grass Valley Group had spin-offs of other tech companies. And, you know, people, people that came to town, some of them brought their own businesses. So there was starting to be a diversity of industries here on small businesses. There was kind of a recession in the early part of the 90s and it kind of backed off as the decade went on. Um, virtually all uh, interest in the county wanted a new general plan and it was adopted in 1995 after a terrible debate. A lot of people were dissatisfied with it. Part of the people thought it was too lenient and they went off to form the Rural Quality Coalition. Another part thought it was too restrictive and they went off to form CabPro. So it was like two little political parties having to do with growth and development in the community. Um, TMI, I worked on planning Lumarica Ranch most of my career. There was a company, TMI, that lost, lost their uh, bid to do anything with it. Mining shows sign, signs of life. There was, um, there was um, I think they got approval to work on the mine in North San Juan. A new Economic Resource Council was formed. It's still going. Um, on the mining, I think back there I missed a story about uh, the, there was a permit to dewater the lava cap mine. To get to the lava cap mine, you go all the way to the top of Banner Lava Cap Road and a long road down to the bottom. Anyway, um, the, the applicants hired an attorney named Harold Berliner, who was mainly thought of as an of environmental attorney, but he was proponent for the mine, and he got it approved at the Board of Supervisors. 
Then there was a referendum to put it on the ballot, and the mine was defeated by eight votes. So, you know, kind of like a Nevada City Council election, right? <laughs> you're you're swept, in, uh, swept in with a mandate by seven votes or three votes or something like that. Um, so it was kind of the first time I realized that how many people you could get in your car and take to the ballot box might make a difference. So in the 1990s, Grass Valley updated their general plan, and it was adopted with a lot more consensus and less, um, less of a frenzy, so I kind of awarded that for 1990 as the best project. In the 2000s, the slow growth is really slowing, but boy, real estate prices just soared. And at our company, we were getting people that wanted to do projects, and I was just thinking, where is all this money coming from? I can't believe the money people have to spend on these things. And prices went up to about where they are now uh, for houses. And there was a feeling among our clients that this is never going to stop, man. <laughs> you know. It doesn't matter how much it costs to get this approved or to, to build it, prices are going through the roof. And then the Great Recession happened, the worst economic situation I've seen in my career, where, um, you know, overnight, you're probably almost overnight, while your property lost 40 or 50 percent in value. And I've seen recessions before where people were stuck with, my, my loan is a little bit higher than what my house is worth, but now, in 2008, 2009, I mean, it was crazy. And people, many, many people I knew that were perfectly capable of making their payment on a $400,000 loan said, this is crazy. You know, my loan's $400,000, $400, my house worth $200,000. I don't care about my credit, I'm getting out. So it was a horrible, horrible downturn. Now, um, tourism was impacted, everything was impacted. Uh, the, the businesses that did the best were businesses that had sales throughout the nation and overseas. In the 2000s, the general plan had called for an open space uh, program called um, Natural Heritage 2020. And a committee was formed to start um, hammering out the details of this new open space program. A lot of biology work was done and, and inventoried. And um, I was a land trust volunteer then, and I thought that this was going to be a great way to find funding for new open space projects and that type of thing. Well, a guy kind of came out of the woodwork named Drew Bedwell, and he was hell on NH 2020, and he got quite a following right away. You guys, they're coming to take your land. They're coming to regulate you out of existence. They're going to find something on your land that makes it impossible to develop. We've got to stop this. So this debate went on and on and on. And finally, the county kind of threw in the towel and said, oh, we're, we're, not going to, we're not going to get this done. Drew Bedwell um, actually was a, elected as a supervisor as a result of that, and later um, died young from a terminal illness. But he um, made his mark. During the 2000s, the uh, county and Grass Valley had design guidelines uh, before the real estate crash, trying to create workforce housing that, that normal job people could afford was the goal. Inclusionary housing, where a percentage of a project is made always affordable, was tried, but didn't really work out too well. There were ballot measures in Grass Valley that wanted uh, growth control. For one thing, they wanted every annexation to be approved by the voters, and those measures were uh, defeated. So I think I'm, I gave NH 2020 the, my um, most important planning of the 2000s just because it really elevated the debate. You know, planning is a tough business where you're constantly in that little space where the, uh, where the individual rights of a property owner meet the goals and objectives of a community. And th this really elevated the, the discussion even though it didn't follow through, and maybe it will in the future. I hope so. In the 2010s, um, hardly any growth. Um, the spin-off video businesses were kind of the mainstay. Real estate values started to stabilize. Um, started, you know, home prices started to come back, but vacant land prices never really 
have come back from what they were before 2008. Uh, Idaho Maryland mine was sold. There, you know, there have been about three attempts. We're on our third attempt on the Idaho Maryland mine to do something with it. San Juan Ridge mine gives up. They had, um, they were working in gravel strata that really uh, almost immediately dewatered wells when they started to work in those areas. So in the 2010s, Lumarica Ranch, which I'd worked on for decades, uh, finally got annexed. The airport commission um, adopted rules around the airport. The city council gave, in Grass Valley gave up on inclusionary housing and in one public hearing to remove that condition from all their projects. Um, people voted for sales taxes, like Nevada City has the uh, sales tax that was, first of all, it was a 10-year deal and then they both made it permanent. The sales taxes in the two cities were one of the smartest things that happened and it probably should have made it the, the most important thing that happened because it's a way that the cities can capture the impact of county residents, right? All the county people drive into town, they use the parks, everything, so they spend some money, they pay some sales tax and it helps offset, the, offset that. Andy, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. just to go back, what's inclusionary? Can you just d explain inclusionary housing? Yes, inclusionary housing is like I um, I come into the planning commission and I get a 20, uh, 20 unit project approved. And a condition of approval is that four of the units have to be made permanently affordable to a middle income group or a certain income group. So a deed restriction goes on those and uh, they stay affordable over a period of time. And um, it's very difficult to do. It's, um, it's something that planning departments and planner, public planners like, because you can show you did something. You know, we did this, uh, but there, it's very hard, very tough. You know, even if, you're, even if you're the recipient and you buy at an affordable rate, now you can't, you can't really enjoy your appreciation because you have to sell at a controlled rate. So they work better on rental housings than, than ownership housing. Uh, but that's that's what inclusionary housing is. Uh, let's see. Housing elements were updated in the 2020s. Uh, county tweaked around on their ordinances. They they noticed on their general plan that in that in 2010 we were supposed to have 140,000 people here, and we only had 100,000 people. So they went through and kind of modified growth projections. Um, Rental housing, lost to Airbnb, still going on. Tech employers struggling to find qualified help, still going on. Uh, NGOs like churches and such adjusted to slower growth. You know, you think if you were planning in the 70s or 80s, you just thought this growth was going for on forever. So like the Catholic Church bought this big parcel out by the fairgrounds, which recently was sold and is now gonna be an RV park, but it was, intended to be to expand the church and school and Catholic school to meet uh, the growth demands. Homelessness and opioid deaths are for real. Isn't that still true? I gave it to Lumarica Ranch just because it had struggled for so long. And by the way, the plan that was approved is a little different than what you see going on out there now. But um, been a lot of call for more housing and that's certainly going to be a, a good part of it there. I think there's 235 units under construction on La Marica Ranch right now. Do you happen to know what the price point is for those? I don't, but I'd say the price point for modest new homes is in the high 500,000s probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're duplexes, right? They're building duplexes. Some are duplexes. Yeah. Some are single With the family. Idea of some are prices down. Some are rear alley. There's a mixture of different types. Um, so COVID, 2020 came and we got COVID. Um, Grass, Valley grew, Grass Valley just recently annexed 400 acres south of town. Hanson Brothers, uh, that whole area along La Barra Meadows Road, uh, which was a pretty big deal. There's a great remodel to the Center for the Arts. I went into this great grand opening of the Center for the Arts and the next month they shut it down for COVID. And by the way, they had millions of dollars of loans to do all that beautiful construction. Uh, the county continues to work on cannabis ordinance. Still, um, poor marijuana has been dividing our society ever since I was in high school. You know, there are people that are just, 
adamantly opposed, and people are going, come on, man, it's economic development. Let's go. Uh, Dorsey Marketplace was approved, a shopping center at Dorsey Drive, and I think it's still in the courts under challenge. Um, the county's received some major grants for housing, so you've seen the uh, housing up above CVS. Uh, they bought a couple of old, um, one at least one old motel. Uh, so they found some money, and they're really doing some good things in terms of trying to address homelessness, but it's a big, big problem and a very difficult one to handle, one that I've always been happy that I'm not in charge of solving. Uh, Higgins Marketplace, which went on for a long time in debate, and I think some court challenges finally opened in the uh, Higgins Corner area. And then SB9, which you're familiar with, says, uh, well, you know, now people can cut their backyard off as a lot and put a house on it. So I don't know how that's going to fare. I, know, I think one thing about SB9 is not a lot of people are going to be interested in it. I don't think a lot of people can afford it. They, well, it's probably a $10,000 uh, process but to, to build make a lot on it is, yeah. is what I mean. Pardon? A lot of people can't afford to build. Yeah, that could be true too. Well, we've had two lot splits, but neither of them have applied for. So we've had no building development. So ten thousand to do the split? Yeah, roughly. Mm -hmm. We've given a couple estimates: uh, city fees, our fees, and associated fees. So the best of the twenty twenties is. You know, you guys will probably help decide what that is. So what's going on right now? The Idaho Maryland Mine EIR is under review, hotly debated. I see a lot more no mining than, than I see pro mining. Cannabis ordinances are being refined and debated. Mill Street has become a mall, much to the chagrin of me and my wife. But they never, you know, people don't listen to me, it turns out. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have said that before I ever started this presentation. Um, so this how new housing, this new homeless housing is being occupied. Film festivals are coming back. I went to the Wild and Scenic Film Festival here, and it was really cool. Um, restaurants close, come and go, and we're starting to see SB9 applications. So what have we learned through all this stuff? Debate usually makes for a better project. But if you take debate too far, too deep, too awful, then it divides the community and it can get out of hand and not be a good thing. So keep it civilized, folks. Extreme policies, either, either to stop growth or promote growth or anything, any extreme policy um, causes a reaction, an equal reaction, so you can get the pendulum swinging back and forth um, pretty hard. Um, economic, I, I don't know, uh, state government doesn't seem to get this in my opinion, and all governments need to realize that economic development is a good thing. You know, what are, you, what are our strategies to import money to our community, to import money and can create jobs? There's a lot of ideas, some of them um, are acceptable, some of them aren't. Uh, tourism is probably okay. Mining, some people are saying no, not, not really a good one. Uh, and we need to keep track of what's going on around us, regional, national, global trends, and to keep, my, keep in mind how we fit in. And uh, we need to continually understand who we are and what we need as a community. Planning, after all, is, is regulation of land use and development to meet community needs. So in planning, the most important thing to remember is how everything is connected. The environment, economics, and community needs for places to live, work, play, etc., cetera, all, all fit together. And like I say, if you tweak one thing, you need to think about how all that's connected and how it affects everything else. So I, th I think that's it. So uh, I appreciate your time. and. You're suffering through this. It's Sean's fault, not mine. Uh, but I really appreciate your time. And I've had a, I've enjoyed, you know, there have been a few minute moments in planning where I wanted Scotty to beam me up. But for the most part, why the career has been fun and interesting. And I appreciate people like you that volunteer your time to help the community. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank, thank you, Andy. Andy. Oh, Very hey, good. Andy, if you have time for a couple questions. Sure. Um, you talked about the, the Nevada County General Plan a couple times and mentioned the Grass Valley General Plan. 
Um, what can you tell us about the origins of the Nevada City General Plan? The Nevada City General Plan had been um, started just before I came on as city planner, and I was here just to kind of see it through to the end. Uh, and I think that a lot of general plan work starts from the need to do a housing element. There are some things that the state requires. Um, I'm not even sure, did Nevada City have a general plan before? I guess they did have a general plan, but it was pretty sparse. But I don't know, the Nevada City General Plan, um, well, I've never been that impressed with it. I mean, I think the consultant just said, do, you know, just leave everything the way it is and send me my money. And so it, it always seemed to me like there should have been more thought put into the vacant land areas in the city, which are quite, quite uh, small or quite limited these days, but just a little bit more thought put into it. But I think since then, um, on the other hand, there's no real burning reason to update it. The state requires uh, housing element updates, which uh, the staff takes care of, but anyway. But the great thing about Nevada City is uh, the more it can stay the same, the more successful it can be. Um, it's, um, it's what the residents want. It's an it's a economic strategy. There's just all the reasons in the world to do that. And uh, a lot of the commission council I worked for were just absolutely afraid of doing anything. I called them the no council. And I'd, I'd, say, I'd say, well, the answer is no. Now, what's your question? But <laughs> since, since then, you know, commissions and councils have stepped out a little bit and done some great work, you know, and it has, you know, nothing's been done to ruin the town. So. Great. Thank you. I, I, anybody else have a question? I have one that's kind of... I think, I think uh, Peter's been doing my exception list here. But, uh. <laughs> Got anything, Peter, for, for, uh, I, for Andy? The only thing I would add is the, uh, the music events at the fairgrounds, because that's how I got here. The oh. Bluegrass Festival, you know, came up from the Bay Area. Oh, this is a nice place, walking walk through point. Nevada City, you know, on a dull morning and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, though, you know, we have like five or six of them now a year. Yeah. So that yeah, that's really great gets thing. people in the, and outside money. Yeah, importing money. That's the point. Um, so, given your perspective at, and the, just the time span of your and your overview, um, there 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 are some developmental differences between Grass Valley and Nevada City, and maybe a controversial question to ask. But could you kind of summarize what the difference maybe in in planning ethos is between? Grass Valley, Nevada City, because we're different. We're very different cities, and we prioritize differently. Yeah, Grass Valley's general plan recognized that, by and large, they're the business center for Western Nevada County, which I think is true. I mean, there's a lot of jobs in Nevada City as well. Um, Grass Valley was slow to to maintain its historic character. In, in fact, I think closing Mill Street is a real affront to that. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're pretty open-minded to businesses and, and, uh, and uh, you know, opening opportunities for jobs and growth. They're a bigger jurisdiction. They had more um, vacant parcels. Uh, Grass Valley has been the affordable housing, has provided all, almost all of the affordable housing until recently, um, you know, with 900, 1,000 units or so that are uh, price controlled through programs. And um, I don't know, it's a, good, it's a good marriage. I love both communities. I grew up in Camptonville and, and, and we referred to Grass Valley and Nevada City as town. We're going to town. So we didn't differentiate too much between the two. But um, anyway, the great thing about planning in California is that each jurisdiction can um, large and by and large map its own destiny. And um, I think Nevada City's done a great job with doing, doing that. And I think for the most part, everything that Grass Valley's done has been fine too. So. I like your statement, it's a good marriage. Yeah. <laughs> it feels that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'd be curious to have you elaborate just a bit more. You made a, a pretty um, uh, 
clear statement that you think the best thing that Nevada City could do is stay the same. And so I guess um, I'm interested in hearing um, what, like which elements of it and why. Well, it really grows out of the historic district. And that's really the area to, where, starting in 1968, Nevada City has decided to take care of it and try to preserve it. And it has the list of uh, contributing buildings and, and that type of thing. And that's what I think um, is the heart of the city. Uh, it's, in large part, part of the heart of the county. It's the anchor tenant of tourism, along with Grass Valley and other places. Um, I don't know. There's so few places left to develop in Nevada City that I'm not too concerned about things changing a lot. You know, there's the mole property north of town that could become something at some point. Um, Sorry, anyway, which, just, which property just, are you saying? Oh, the, it's called, the, I always call it the mole property. The mole property? Manzanita Diggins area. Across from Sugarloaf, so Coyote Street, across. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sugarloaf on the right hand, left side. And, um, That's the highway. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so I don't know. I, th I think just be careful. Try to keep everything in the character of the town. We're talking about that large lot that's been for sale for four or five years. <coughs> I don't know if it's for sale or not. It comes and goes. Huh. Yeah. yeah, it's mostly the old digging, the old man's need to dig in. It's got these high bluffs, and there's a fair amount of usable land in there, and it's probably something the city needs to take control of at some point. So, anyway, thank you. Thanks. thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Know, know how precious it is. <laughs> I thought there was going to be a test. <laughs> That'll come later. Later. Yeah. Well, we don't know it wasn't yet. <laughs> All right. Back to the agenda. Item two, uh, historic sign 426 Broad Street. I'm using hanging sign for Espiritu Art. Are the applicants here? Hi. And I can, I can, let me do a quick introduction, um, oh, you're, and, and then you can, they'll, they'll have some questions for you. So, um, business owner, you can, you can have a seat. Sorry, I pushed the seat out of the way, but that's really for you. <laughs> um, business owner, Paula, and, and um, property owner. Paula Madariaga, did I get that right? Okay, sorry. Is applying for a new hanging sign for her business, Espiritu Art, um, which is a cafe and gallery and artist workshop space at 426 Broad Street. The sign is proposed to hang from an existing sign structure, which was approved in 1983, probably under um, Andy Cassano. <laughs> uh, and it's located in the southwest corner of the property near the sidewalk. Madariaga has provided three options for the commission's consideration. Um, and I provided all three of those. They have some, that, you know, a lot of commonalities, really just the, um, the colors are what's changing, but it'll be a, is it a hand-painted wood sign? I'm not, I wasn't sure if I understood that correctly it's in your hand. email. It's hand-painted. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's going to be two-sided. Um, both sides will add up to 13.44 square feet. The lettering sty style is Beshilo. I wasn't sure. With that, but it's a, it's got a, um, it's a serif, serif style, um, stylized uh, font, um, and I said the graphic was a paint stroked, circled P. Is that what that is? That it? What the graphic is? Okay, yes. I'll, I'll bring it up here in just a second, um, and then the the background colors, like I said, are are changing. Um, they one's like a, a cool tone gradient uh, coloring graphic. With sort of purple letters, and then the other, the, the the second option would be wood tones, so a light wood stain versus a, um, for the graphic portion, and then the font uh, a dark wood stain, and all these would be over a white background, um, and then the third option would be sort of a more of like a aqua blue um, tone with the purple lettering. 
So I'll bring I'll bring those options up so you can take a look. So those are, the, those are the three options, and I can zo I can kind of zoom in, but I was just going to have you I was going to have a have the graphic show all three. And with that, that's the end of my report. Okay. Any uh, questions for staff or for the applicant from commissioners? Uh, my question I didn't notice for sure, and I think Amy, you just tried to ask in terms of like how is it constructed? It is it's wood. We hope. Oh, there it is, hand painted. There it is. Um, so it's not uh, graphics, it's not like a vinyl it's graphic, it's wood. And then in terms of the shape of the sign, is it a simple s rectangle? Did you have any plans for routered edges or corners or anything? Or is it, this, is, this is literally a mock-up of the sign? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I think it's going to be like this, uh -huh. like a rectangle. Gotcha. But I haven't done anything. I am waiting for the But this, this fits. The, in. This is the style. Okay. Because yesterday I realized this is too long. Okay. And I can put it in the same in both way if I do that. This is why I grab this one. So that fits in your frame. Yeah. And um, this is going to be the same style like this, but everything. Yeah. Scaled down. And, and this is the my first option. And then I, I got a little bit confused on the option to letter in color just because it says stain. So does that mean it's painted white but then see through with stain? Or is it painted brown, too brown? It's brown. It's painted brown. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, um, uh, so the, the s s stain is... is uh, an incorrect term. It's going to be you're you're proposing to paint it yeah, on yeah, on a white background. Exactly. And the, all the colors are is in, in each one. This is the the way we put this like a, sta a standardized like color tone. So it's not a specific paint manufacturer's um, color palette. It's a but it's a standardized tone. That's yeah. I had yeah. the same question. Pantone. It's the Pantone palette. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yes. <laughs> is the light wood stain, dark wood stain, not stain, but color, is that also a Pantone color? Are you talking, oh, sorry, are you talking about option two? Um, no, option three. No, that was option two. No, option two is brown and like this. Yeah. But those are not Pantone uh, colors? No. This is the, the second one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess what we have in our staff report differs no, from not, this. Yeah. Okay. The colors of brown. I see. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think the confusion is that in our report it reads that it's a light wood stain and a dark wood stain, and it doesn't read those colors. Uh -huh. That's why we're confused. Uh -huh. Okay. So clarified. Yeah, clarified. Cool. Um, uh, so the background is white. Yes, white. Okay. White painted. Wait, this okay. really threw us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, public comment on this application. Anybody present like to make a public comment regarding the sign designer proposal? No one present? Anyone online? Anybody online wish to make a comment? Please raise your virtual hand, and I do have someone. Judith, you're welcome to address the commission. You're, and you're, you're currently muted. There you go. Hello? Yep, hello. Oh, you're uh, muted again. Oh, yep. How's that? Yep. yep there you go. All right. Thank you. Sorry, I am just a technical Luddite. I am just 
so far behind. But um, I do know uh, typeface, I do know signage, and I do know that we have an expert in our community that could kind of help streamline your process because as a citizen, I have difficulty that you sit around talking about colors and lavenders and purples when really there's so much more important work for you to do. And what's holding this up is the whole historic ordinance about the signs. So if you're really insisting on historic signs that sort of match the, the time that the building was built, you know, like that, that's what you want, you want to go back to that, then it has to be made very clear. And the best way to do that is to, I think, get Ms. Moth on as a, as a, a liaison because she's really expert in this sort of stuff. What we have here is just, it's a beautiful design. You've got basically the one option with a different color schemes. Uh, this one's the less, I guess, uh, for a person who is visually oriented, as artists usually are, I walk up street and all these signs just scream at me. Okay, it's visually disturbing. So I like the restful and the not jumping out in front of everybody else. And, uh, but these are vanity signs. These are not the kind of signs that our ancestors made because they were just selling stuff. You know, cigars, to, I saw one, cigars, tamales, and chocolate. You know, huge black and white sign back in the 1800s. But it's different now. These people want to express themselves through their business, through their image. And I'd like to see a separation. I'd like to see not so much time taken up on this. Uh, in the, when we have other really pressing, summer's coming, really pressing issues. I know I don't want to create a bigger government by just adding another layer, but I still think that the best solution is to get um, Ms. Moth and maybe a, a little group of her, uh, uh, some kind of people that know what they're talking about. And it, it's very frustrating, you know, to see this, uh, how that people don't really understand, you know, you know, graphics. So um, that's all I have to say. It's, it's a lovely sign. I, uh, I see a lot of signs popping around town that are not going through the <laughs> commission. So I think the, the floodgates open and we need to decide whether and somehow get it across the community, either a historic community or an artistic evolving community. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. Thank you. This would be a really good comment for council as well. Okay, any other public comment? Nope. Uh, no, seeing none. Okay. Uh, any any uh, uh, commission discussion um, regarding the design or the various colorways? Um, discussion or questions? Uh, discussion. Good questions, yeah. Well, we, we, could ask we can questions. still ask it's more, I guess. General, yeah. general discussion now. Um, I, I'm going to stumble around this. I, I do think it's a lovely sign. I also, I don't know if I am agreeing with Judith or not. Um, I hope I am. Uh, I also feel that it is not necessarily in the, the vein of the historic aim that we're taking with signs. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure where to take it next. Anyone else? Yeah, oh, go ahead. I'm going to say I, I echo what you said, Amy, that uh, I like the sign, actually. It's really nice. But our ordinance starts off with compatible with mother load. And I think this is a stretch too far. We stretch signs. And, but, you know, and I, I know you've got an artistic business, and I, I like that. But uh, I, I think for the public uh, face of it, we, we need to see more, uh, more connection with mother load. I'm, I'm in that vein. I, you know, I think it's a, a lovely graphic for a business card. I think you've done a very nice job. Um, and just as a side note, my interest in clarifying colors is because I really want to understand your vision before I make any, you know, form, formal opinion about what it is. And so that's, that's my interest there. Um, and I would, I would concur with the committee as well as um, the, the public comment that, um, the commission and the public comment that, there's opportunity to make it truly representative of the historical context of your business. So, yeah. I'd be a little more. I'd be a little more specific in the feedback. So, um, to me, there are a few elements that uh, jump out. I, I'm echoing some of the same things again as everyone has said. I think it's a, a lovely design, but in looking at our sign guidelines, 
Um, some specific things have to do with, you know, the color palette. There's definitely a preference for uh, the historic tones, or at least things that are analogous to those. In the first one, you know, the gradient, um, I think, is something which uh, does not fall or couldn't be seen to be uh, within that. Similarly, on the third option, the, the sort of teal color that's in there also is, I would say, um, more opposing to that. Uh, next, looking at the way some of the elements work together, um, if you look at a lot of the examples that, that are within the guidelines in general, you'll see a separation of lettering versus the graphic element. Um, the, the, the swish, the paint stripe along the A, although lovely, you know, doesn't really uh, conform to sort of that general aesthetic that we're looking for there. Uh, also, you'll see some specifics in terms of, you know, we're really looking for a, a uh, a lot of times you'll see in there the examples are given where uh, the graphic element is more directly figurative, you know, analogous to the business. And I think that's what you're, what you're working to get across here, especially in terms of the, the uh, paint swish and the, the painting. But I would make that uh, more clear, more obvious in that direction. But again, um, a lovely design. I just don't think looking at the guidelines, it fits well with that. Same thing, lovely sign. Um, uh, and uh, in the, the, uh, the gradient thing, it, it has no, uh, there's no way in, in terms of having a historic feel, there's no way a gradient could be hand painted. Um, so that would be like a, a, a computer printing process. Um, I mean, it would be a lot of work and it just uh, it would, doesn't appear um, consistent with the mother load style. The gradient. So solid colors uh, are preferred personally. My the, the warm colorway in the center is the most appropriate. Um, and uh, um, it, I'll just echo whatever what everyone else is saying. The the logo to the to the left is is could be reduced greatly in size. We discourage logos pretty much, but they are certainly happening. Um, but they, they uh, a logo, just this, a symbol that is a sort of a branding statement for your business um, uh, should be reduced in size in, 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 in comparison to the text. And the, 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 uh, the swoop over the A um, probably should just be text. Um, so uh, that's that's me. Uh, how shall we how shall we give useful direction? Right. Uh, are there other reference images that we might or at, you know there's been a suggestion that there is a a popular sign maker in town, although not the only one. There's other sign makers that people use if they're having wooden carved signs or there's all kinds of sign makers. I wonder, were you planning on painting your own sign since you are an artist? No. You were going to have it yes. made. Okay. Um, but uh, if there are references to other more appropriate type signs to kind of as a template or something? I, I, I was thinking of maybe a suggestion uh, if, if you took a tour downtown and looked at signs and Kind of look for the consistent elements that fit with the buildings, the older buildings, and that sort of thing. And maybe something would pop up that would fit both with your business and the mother load compatibility. Um, Although keep in mind, not all signs yeah. are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's my hesitation well, there. And by the way, thank you for coming in and participating in the process. Yeah. We should. <laughs> have yeah. I, th I think that the guidelines themselves, you know, are are the best reference, you know, overall because the things in there, you know, have, you know, are examples or potentially looking at some of the things that were recently uh, approved by uh, this this commission. And Amy can probably help with some of those there that are in addition to some of the older things that are in the uh, more recent ones. That we've yeah, 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 yeah. And I will say, in in my opinion. Um, you know, Judith is on point in that there is more to a great sign than just checking sure. off the marks 
of what's within, sure. you know, in terms of great design and something that's truly cohesive, not only with, you know, the design of the sign itself, but how how it interacts um, with the building and the architecture surrounding. I do I do feel like there's more to it than that, it, you know. So. It's true. It's true in general that everything we do. And even the do. construction of it, the construction <laughs> yeah. of the sign, you see the difference between a flat plywood painted white versus you know, a routered edge and some different little touches that really, that type of attention to detail was important to people. That's why we have these houses that have all the gingerbread on them is all that architectural, you know, stuff mattered, so. That's also why people come here too, you know, in addition to making sure it just meets the standards of right. the yeah. guidelines too, yeah. so. I'll say in fairness, the Good and Company sign, your neighbor, yeah. doesn't, ha it has a lot of flourishes. Um, and so, uh, in fairness, I don't. I don't think. I don't think your design is far off. Yeah. Um, um, but a more directly legible font, maybe that that suggests what you like, some 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 flow. Uh, but it. Uh, but that's more. That's more uh, um, um, direct or restrained. Not quite as flowing or... Yeah, but the thing that I... I'm sorry, English is my second language. I, 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 had, I understood, but not everything. Okay, sure. I have a question. If I take off this, because maybe is this part, is this, this tour for you? I, is that what's disturbing the design if you take it off? If it, yeah, if it were just that, without, if it were just the yeah, letters without the logo. To, to be clear what you really want sure mm -hmm. because i want to put a sign because i want to make nice the place for me the sign if it's outside or not is not something that interests me but i know if i put it i can add value to the community this is why i put the gallery and if you are there you are going to see not just a coffee shop you are going to see something else and this is why i am trying to put something else in my sign, in my sign, mm -hmm. too. Uh, but I want to be clear, if it, I put this work or not. That, uh, that's an improvement for me yeah. in, in terms of, um, and then I think still the A, as beautiful as that A is, uh -huh. it, um, it definitely brings a more modern contemporary feel to the, to this, the rest of the, the sign. I do think that the art and gallery and cafe, art gallery and cafe font uh, reminds me of what the Broad Street Books font was like before. Is anyone else? I, I don't necessarily. I don't necessarily have a problem with the font yeah, if, yeah, that, it's it's just if the, that stripe is removed. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, right. but yeah. The, the two the two the two different fonts in the in the in the in the, in the uh, brown colorway. Mm -hmm. I can do that in brown. Uh, is that? Is this that? is my favorite color, but if it doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> this is why I have the three colors. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> because I, I, I thought maybe one of them <laughs> they can choose. I think from a uh, process standpoint, we continue this rather than say yes or no. We continue it, continue this, and. You come back but I think we can give design. some, if we have more yeah, specific right. instructions. Yeah, we'd, yeah. We'd, like, we'd like to give the applicant really clear direction uh, so that you only have to come back once. And, and yeah. so I, I agree, Peter, yeah, we'll, we'll continue it. And you'll just come back with the, with the modified design. Um, it's, um, it's, I heard there are people in agreement about the font is okay if the, with the removal of the, uh, the switch. The is switch. The A is in yeah. the, the font yes. of the E, right? Yep. The capital A's. Yeah, the capital take, A's. take that out. Yeah. Go for a brown tone. The I don't even tone. know if I have if it has to be brown. Yeah, I, I think it has to be brown. I agree, actually. I don't yeah. think it has to be brown. I think it could be that purple, just all. It could all be your favorite color. One. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one color. It, 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 That's my opinion. And I, I agree. Um, uh, because this, we have, add this, this is like a brush. Right. And right. this is an art color. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is why I add it. But I understand if you don't like in that way. So we're unanimous about the about the, the brush stroke on the A. So yeah. perhaps we can just 
approve it then if we're feeling that way that it can stay that same color, what she's presenting here, just remove the brush stroke. And the gradient color, it would be. Yeah, just everything yeah. the same color. Yeah. Everything, everything in the solid color. In, in, in the solid color and the, 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 the last color, uh, correct? Is that the one you prefer? Yeah, I prefer the. And that's the, la that's the third I think the it's, third so that's color. The it's option one. one. It's the Pantone 667C. Six, six, the, the purple first color one. is the same in the, the, same. the yeah. first option. Is oh, okay. Got it. I'm sure there's a purple on the historic there palette. Probably, yeah, there is. We could, I mean, if, you're, if we can find color. one from there. It's the same color. The first right. one is just these colors. It's just yeah. one mm -hmm. color. It, because I did that in case you didn't want it, the gradient. Uh, I, I think we could. I think we could do approval and approval, and uh, and um, we could appoint a a, a, a liaison, uh, one of the commission members, to look at your final design and color and, and uh, uh, confirm that that's what that's what we were talking about, and then you can just proceed. You won't have to come back for a full meeting, so you can get going faster that way. So. Um, uh, Let's let's have a motion then describing the. Okay, I'll the, try. I can try. Wendy? I move we approve the sign with the condition that the font be um, a solid purple color um, and uniform without any an artistic rendering of the A. Um, and it's a hand painted wood or it's a hand painted wood sign. And removal right? of the. And removal of the graphic. Yeah. If you switch. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Second. I'll second. That must be popped in because. Okay, hey, um, Commissioner Urmshar. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Van Zant. Yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, do we have a volunteer for a liaison? I, I'm in town all the time. I could totally do that. Okay, Wendy yeah. Urmshar will be your okay. liaison. So when you're ready with the uh, with the, the the new design. Uh, contact Amy, and she'll put you in touch with okay. with yeah. uh, Commissioner Urbshaw. Okay, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and best of luck in your with your business. With your yeah. business. Yeah. Really today happy to see. Happy birthday. Hey, happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> Maybe not the present she wanted, but it's a present. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming. That's so cute. Ah, Nevada City Winery. Right. Next up, uh, 321 Spring Street, new sign for Nevada City Winery. Yes, so um, business ma manager Kim Kravasara, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping I don't have to say it again, is applying for a replacement hanging sign for the Nevada City Winery business, um, which is a winery and tasting room at 321 Spring Street. Um, it's going to hang from an existing bracket where the old sign is. I don't know how long ago that one um, was I removed. I honestly but don't know either. I feel like I, ju I just realized it was gone um, not that long before you guys came in with this new sign. So the new sign will be um, painted and stained wood with a metal frame. It will be two-sided. Um, total uh, square footage for both sides is just under the 24 square foot limit. Um, lettering style is bell. Uh, MT and she she suggests that it's very similar to two um, true golden and Ben Ben Quiet, uh, font styles that are listed in our um, signage uh, guidelines. The graphic uh, will include a gold leaf grape clusters and grape leaves. Uh, colors uh, will be the background color is stained wood and then the lettering is uh, white color. And I'll pull up the signage. Concludes my report. Oh, did it not show up? Oh, I think my, my, uh, yeah, the, my, my plug keeps coming loose. Uh, are there any questions from the commission of the applicant or of, uh, of the staff? Nope. I have one, if no one else does. Maybe a couple. Um, 
uh, stained wood is uh, is it a, a solid wood sign like like carved or sandblasted with mm -hmm. the lettering? Uh, yeah. Reset. So it's two inches thick. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a cedar wood. Um, so it kind of was kind of going with that that Mama Madrone sign. It's kind of a thick wood and mm -hmm. then it's carved on the top. So that's what it looks like. Um, but we needed to have it at least two inches thick so that we could sandblast. So it would look like the letters are elevated, but it's not. But the sandblasting, it just takes off that soft wood and leaves the wood grain, so mm -hmm. you can kind of see that whole, you know, I love that part about the natural look of the wood. So we were just kind of, kind of accentuating that, but it needed to be thicker in order to do it. And the gold leaf section is also, it's got a, a sandblasted relief behind it, so it's a, it's, mm -hmm. it's a flat and so it smooth. Feels, yeah, so if you, uh, the sign, the frame around the outside, the kind of lighter stain, that is the original two inch, that'll be, um, elevated the letters are elevated the grapes are elevated but so the depressed part is all of the darker stained mm -hmm. areas okay. does that make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes perfect sense yeah, yeah. what it looks like I, that's what it looks like so okay. uh, i just want to like, <laughs> clarify all the details it looks um, like what it looks like mm -hmm. and, and are the are the leaves in relief as well mm -hmm. okay yes. I really wanted that carved out concept, you know, I really like that. Mm -hmm. I think that really honors the era. I wanted it to look like we were honoring, the, am I talking, am I allowed to talk? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This, I this is when you I talk. Just yeah, to all you want. I really <laughs> wanted to do that. I also wanted to do the, the metal frame on the outside because we're in the foundry building and they were a metal fabricator and I really wanted that. Also, the other sign came down because we had the the uh, screw eyes at the top of the wood and eventually the water eroded mm. the wood and that's mm. why that sign came down. It came down in that big windstorm a couple of years ago. And so I wanted to have a frame around it to distribute the weight so that we oh, wouldn't cool. have, so that we wouldn't have that problem again and then have to reinvest in having another sign made. Who's gonna make this? Um, so actually it's going to be a number of different people because we're still trying to recover from the not earning any money. So I'm going to do the painting myself. I have a friend who's going to get the wood. He's going to source it locally and he's going to put it all together. Um, I have another friend who's going to do the sandblasting for me. And um, another, oh, we'll have to hire out the metal works. I can't do that. Um, but then I'll, you know, I'll do, I'll put it all together and, and paint it. So. Stone soup sign. Yeah, it's just, this is called doing the best we can with as little money as possible. Well, I think it looks good. Do yeah, you? Okay, good. I think it's great. You would. Yeah. I love it. It's like a okay. very high quality sign. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, any public comment at this, at this time in the house about this sign design or uh, application? Thumbs up. Uh, to uh, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't an official poll. Uh, any any uh, comments? Judith Lowry has her we virtual do. hand I, up. I, I didn't realize they still have Judith um, up there. So uh, Judith, you can, you're already on. You can go ahead and address the committee. Thank you. Um, okay, so this sign does have, it, it kind of does lead to the historic. You know, it's, it's trying to conform to your historic ordinance. And it's elegant. It's, it's discreet. But it does, it does state itself. You know, those letters that are bold uh, against the black background. But nice typeface. Good use of historic materials. I give it a thumbs up. Thank you. Thanks, Judith. <laughs> Thanks, Judith. Thank you, Judith. Uh, well, shall we? Uh, any uh, any comment? Any discussion from the commission? I'm ready to make a motion. Right. Ditto. Not for me. Move to approve as presented. Is there a second? I second. We got it. Because they're speaking in the microphone. Oh, sorry. sorry. It should it should pick up um, the waves, but I'm not sure why. <laughs> I'll just have to remind Applicants. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. Oh, sorry. Who motioned and who seconded? Peter motioned and and uh, uh, Wendy. Wendy. Uh, Thanks. That lady. <laughs> that lady. The one on the end. <laughs> second. Commissioner yeah. Ermshar. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Van Zant. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Motion passes. Thank you very much. The fact Thank that you're you. doing it yourself kind of adds a little yeah, I love buzz it. to it. I mean, it's nice the way it is if you were going to go out and get it manufactured, but it's, I'm like, I like hearing that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a lovely, elegant design.
looking forward to having it up and getting that band down. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it. No, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Architecture review uh, is the next item, item four, 204 Clay Street, new and replacement windows and skylights. Yeah, please. So this was, are you Phoebe and are you Derek? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Property owners and there's it sounds like there's an it, there's at all involved in this in the ownership of this property. Um, uh, neither the assessor, just from background on the property itself, um, the assessors nor the um, property owner has an estimate of the date of construction. But the property or the building does seem to show up on the 1898 Sanborn maps, so it's at least that old. Um, the applicant is proposing to replace two existing. Uh, Call them one by double hung um, because what he's doing is two by double hungs, and I'll I'll show you that to you on the on the, the big screen here in a minute. Um, but I didn't know what else to call them. There's probably a more appropriate word that um, mold. That Sharon two units mold called. together. Okay, two units mold together. <laughs> um, double hung on the upper level of the north and south elevations. Uh, the applicant is also proposing to add two skylights on the roof of the north elevation, and two new double hung windows on the lower floor of the south. Um, floor elevation. Uh, the proposed windows will be Anderson 400 series um, featuring wood cladding with vinyl exterior and I will bring up the elevations here because that probably does a better job of illustrating exactly what they're trying to do. Uh, uh, I'm a little confused. Wood, wood cladding with a vinyl exterior. So it's a, they're, they're wood sash on the inside and vinyl on the outside? They're wood throughout. Okay. I just copied what was in the actual application and I should have clarified with you. Okay. So, north, this is the existing north. We've got, uh, my big screen. Okay, so for this one, it's essentially the, the home, so. Yeah, I'm trying to find the existing and the, um, got to move things, move little windows around to get to the top. Okay, so this is the, this is what this proposed. Let me go back up so you can kind of see it a little better. This is the, um, what was, what's existing. They've got this, the single non-mold <laughs> double hung window. And then two skylights in the in the uh, or no skylights in the in the existing, and then two skylights, and then a two double hung mold together. <laughs> there, and I think that's that's all for the north elevation and for the south elevation. They're adding the two windows um, on the lower level, and is that it for the south elevation? Also, oh, and they're the oh, doing the same thing for this. Is there a before a view of that? Um, yep. Right. There's half a photograph of that. Oh, the half window's not there? Yeah, that's just the, uh, the tiger. Yeah. Oh, the tiger. okay. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But wait, there is a half window, though, isn't there? Well, oh, no, not, there not is. Not in actuality. There are this right there, picture. that's there a half is. window on uh, the photograph. Because I, I think I looked at that. It's a little window, yeah. Oh, it's, it's like a transparent. It's a little, yeah, it's, there it is. It's a bathroom window. Got it. Yeah. There it is right there. Okay. <laughs> there is a half window. All right, yeah, transparent. <laughs> exists. Looks like it goes up into the roof. Oh, yeah, it does. Not a drafting so artifact. Yeah. <laughs> right. The roof sucked it up. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, uh, any, let's see, do you have, it, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, uh, the existing upstairs windows don't need egress, uh, so mm. you know they should be replaced anyway. But that's trying to bring in more light. Yeah, um, the existing windows keep my son up all night, and therefore he ends up in our bed every night. And nobody's <laughs> <in sleep. laughs> so there's there's that. It's um, efficiency, and it's also like it's a 130 year old house. It's dark in a lot of areas. So I'm just trying to bring in a little bit more light while maintaining the, the historic look of the house. 
the front two windows, we're not, the front bedroom, we're not changing. It has two windows. So we just want to sort of mimic what is in the front on each side. I couldn't tell because there was a big tree so in, yeah. the, in the image that I saw. And then so. um, the new windows that we're adding, uh, it's actually the only like south-facing wall. And it's where I'm working all the time. So I'm really wanting more light. And if you see in the pictures to me, it looks like it's always been there. Like I don't know why there aren't windows there. Mm -hmm. It's a giant wall without the doors. I uh, see any questions from the commission. I, I did have a question. Um, the widths look different on, are, are the proposed windows wider than the existing windows? It comes across over. Downstairs or upstairs? Uh, any of them, any of them. So the plan is basically to just double the upstairs ones. Okay, it, with, this, with the same width as what's there yeah. now. Okay. With, I think a seven inch. I'm just also planning on mimicking the front with the space between the two windows. It's seven inches. Yeah, so they won't technically be mold. They'll be two units with this mm -hmm. frame in between to match the same reveal of the sign. Oh, okay. So, okay. Right, essentially, you know. Oh, I see. That'll be the aesthetic from inside now as if they were mold. Okay, so so the uh, the the um, the way they're joined is is similar to other other windows in close proximity on the, yeah, on the back. Yeah, they're actually framed, they're actually framed in. Okay. Yeah. Closely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you wouldn't necessarily know that they weren't mold yeah. once they're installed, but they're mimicking the same spacing that's already existing on them. You think you can kind of see it right here, right? This is the, that's the front right yeah. there? Okay, I was trying to get a picture of it. From Those ones are a little bit narrower, so it'll look just like that with a little bit wider windows. Hmm. Oh, so the window is a little bit the window is wider? These, the front has two already. Okay. And um, they're pretty small windows. The two bedrooms have a wider window, so we're just gonna double the two wider windows. Are, is, are we looking for clarity about how the new size compares to the old size? Yeah. Is it the exact same size of this window just times two, or are you using yeah. two smaller windows? Is yeah. that what people are asking? Yeah. I think they're just saying it's it's it's, it's not it's wider than the ones that are on the front. Exactly. Got there's it. there's two different sizes of windows on the house now. Is what I'm yeah. hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Wider than the ones on the front, but the same as the ones that are currently there. Uh, good for questions then. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Uh, is there any public comment uh, in the house about this application, or is there anyone online? Judith Lowry. <laughs> Judith, you can go ahead and address the commission. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. This is more my husband's bailiwick than mine. He's more structural and I'm more aesthetic, but I do see it as a perfect marriage of aesthetics and practicality. Um, to me, the proportion of the single window looks a little like it might have been a, an economic decision, you know. Uh, th those things cost money in the new windows. and. Uh, to see, to see it match the other side, I think it's aesthetically pleasing. I think it's not going to hurt the historic look, but it also brings more life to the house, which helps us reduce energy, is what we're trying to do with all these old relics, right? So um, I, I, I would say I, I would approve it, and um, good luck to the proponent. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Judith. <laughs> Thanks, Judith. Um, okay, any commission discussion? I did forget to ask, there isn't any information about the sunroof. Um, I don't know if there's any, there's just not a schematic per se on that, otherwise there's this little drawing, but you included so much in terms of the type of window. Um, mm -hmm. Is this a, is it a bubble? Is it flat? Do we need to no, think about flat. any of that? Yeah. No, okay. Class, yeah, okay. I kind of figured, but. Have you chosen a brand? Uh, like a Vila. Okay. Yeah. And they're small because they The only one to choose, right? The only one to choose. Um, I think it makes, I think Judith summarized it very well. <laughs> I would agree <laughs> again. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just, uh, the, the only concern I have at all, I think it's, it's, I think it's great and why wouldn't you do what you're doing, um, is in the rendering, I don't see a sill detail uh, on, the, on the widened windows. I, I believe that they said that uh, this, it was going to be trimmed as the others 
Okay, so 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 it will have a sill like all the other windows. The trim will be the same. And there's even a little corbel on your trim, right? Yeah. Okay. So that will have to be applied, but yeah, it'll be applied to match uh, the adjoining windows. All the windows in the house are fairly consistent in their appearance. With that okay. same, what did you call it, a corbel? It's like a little corbel. Yeah. Is that an apron technically? It's both. Right. I think there's both. Corbel it's, apron? Yeah, it's, it's both, right? There are little there's corbel corbels details. with an apron, apron in between. Corbels with a corner yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Could be epaulets if they were oriented differently. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> That's true. But they're on your shoulders. We're yeah. very serious here, but you know. Especially um, about the windows. <laughs> we love architectural details. Um, so, uh, sounds, sounds great. You've answered my questions. Um, uh, I would... Uh, um, I would, I would say that, that a motion should include uh, uh, a stipulation that, that because the, the, the drawing is the representation of the project that we're approving, so we'll need to add language that uh, requires that the window trim be duplicated. Uh, so I'm not, do we make reference to the map? Did you just put it on, if, if you put it mm -hmm. in your, uh, is it in the application itself? Well? Well, we can, they can but, Yeah, we'll it. just put it in the motion. As long as you guys are okay with yeah. it, we'll yeah. just put it in there. I think it's I said to be trimmed out. Okay, sorry, sorry if I missed New it, trim though. to match existing. Okay. That's what it says, yeah. Well, then we could just approve as app, as, a, as... As presented. As presented, yeah. I move that we approve as presented. I will second. Uh, Commissioner Ermshar. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Van Zandt. Yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, item five, four hundred Railroad Avenue. Um, one bedroom additions on, I lost my place. Oh, here we are. Um, no, I still lost my place. It's been about a year since we, right? Right, I think. At, yeah, January 22nd. Not more. 22, I mean, January ah. 22. Ah. Additions to existing cabins. Hello again. Hello again. <laughs> okay, so this is an application by Heritage Hotel Group, um, represented by architect Andrew Pulowski, and I guess Andy Casano knows that as well. It's a surprise for me. Um, not really a surprise. I didn't, I didn't realize you were coming to this one. Uh, in 1984, the Planning Commission approved a master plan for the construction of the Northern Queen Hotel, which included 36 units and two buildings, a conference room of 1,920 square feet, a coffee shop, uh, a laundry room, Yada yada. T t total master plan was approved, which result resulted in an increase of on-site development <coughs> to include a total of 101 motel rooms, approximately 5,000 square feet of conference facil facilities, and 3,250 square feet of restaurant space, as well as a pool, spa, and other amenities. Um, and then I've listed um, other other additions and um, developments that have gone on over the years. Uh, more recently, at the January 20th, 2022 meeting, the Planning Commission approved a site plan amendment for the expansion of the Northern Queen Inn that included a new 20-unit hotel building and three of 12 proposed new cabin units, which are required to be located outside of the 100-foot setback of Old Run Creek. The applicant today is, um, at, I think at that, that meeting, they had indicated that um, that the the rent, rental of the cabins would be more popular if they could have a little bit larger, and so so some of the ones that were not approved had a larger um, floor area, and so this is sort of um, I think an attempt to accommodate the, what some of their their uh, guests are are asking for. Um, so that they're requesting to construct uh, a 168 square foot one bedroom addition to each of three existing hillside cabins. Um, number 313, 314, and 315. The addition would match the existing cabin materials and color um, per the, the application. Um, and in the application, they provided, a, um, I think it's probably the easiest one to get a good view of the, the front of the, the building, but they showed 212. So not one of the ones um, that are actually being expanded, but uh, representative. And I will pull up. 
floor plans and colors. Oh, and the site plan, I guess, is probably maybe the, the best thing to look at. Start with the site plan. Okay. So I'll try to orient you a little bit. Ooh, sure you can. So uh Um, Railroad Avenue is over here, uh, entrances over here, right? Yeah, entrances here. Um, the, the existing hotel building is um, where I've got my cursor, restaurant here. The new hotel building is here. Uh, existing cabins are all uh, the, the red, these red squares here. The additions are going here, here, and here. So all outside of the 100 foot uh, footprint or 100 foot setback. And then this is, there's a couple floor plans for these three units. So basically, existing unit, they're adding a, a one bedroom addition. And then same with the next one. And then in this case, they're adding the bedroom on this side. Anything you'd like to add? No, other than uh, uh, the owner and myself have review, reviewed the stock report and the conditions of approval. I'm just here to answer any questions anybody might have. Is there going to be any other kind of updating to the existing cabins when these are built on? Uh, help me understand updating. Um, you mean in, exterior or? Uh, exterior and interior. Not that I'm aware of at this time. Um, I've not received any direction from the owner about that. I, I suppose they might take the opportunity to maybe upgrade the appliances and some of the finishes, but we've been so far away from that level of the drawings to date that we really haven't gotten any conversation on that. Okay. I mean, I would imagine the exterior will get repainted in its entirety just so it's cohesive, but... Uh, Quite candidly, the, the drawings have been at this early stage for so long that I haven't really gotten into any conversation with the owner about that. Okay. Is there something in particular that's of interest or? Nope. Okay. I mean, I, I ask in the context of, um, I just have very large questions about the Northern Queen um, in general. <laughs> uh, it's, a very, it's a very large piece of property. It is a large, it's a large operation. And uh, I, I remember last year reviewing the project that came up in January, taking a walk around the property and just noticing that in general, there is a lot of dilapidation um, and being curious about the overall intention of the owners, I think. Um, not that it has anything to do with our decision here today. Um, yeah. I'm just taking the opportunity to ask. I think it's a valid concern. I, I do recollect the discussions and the commentary that we heard about um, debris on the site. Um, if, Padlock, if that, padlocks instead of door handles on okay. some of the doors. Yeah, I don't remember that particular one. I remember a lot of discussion about, you know, um, materials like unused appliances and, and fallen trees and things like that. I do recall that part of it. Yeah. And, you know, coming on the heels of Stormageddon, I, I think a lot of that damage was still <laughs> evident. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but I, I do recall those conversations. I guess the only thing that um, gave me pause uh, because I thought that, and this just might, you know, I'm not a building expert. Uh, I thought there weren't aluminum windows anymore in California. Is So it says there's aluminum windows, but um, is that just because they're commercial grade instead of residential? I don't know that we would put in new aluminum windows. If it says so in the drawings, that's a mistake. You know, we would probably do like a fiberglass window that had the same profile. Um, and I'm sorry, is there a note that... Uh, uh, let me look. I, Maybe it's well, in the staff report. I saw aluminum 
So um, in the application, it says vertical grooved. Oh, wait, sorry. It says windows are black aluminum frame, dual pane insulated glass. I think there was an effort on our part to, to, to match the existing, but you are correct. I mean, that's a, that's a difficult uh, energy hurdle to get over. Um, the key here is that we would install something that's identical to what's there, if not closely compatible in its appearance. And that could be accomplished. I mean, there are still aluminum windows made, and they have a, a thermal break that keeps the energy from the outside from moving inside and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But not very common, mm -hmm. but can be done. Thank you. The key we're trying to impress is that the, the new will look like the old. Gotcha. Any other questions? Uh, Not for me, no. None for me. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and any public comments on this uh, application? In the house? Anyone online? Anyone wishing to make a comment on this application? Please raise your virtual hand. Doesn't look like we're having no a virtual mic. hand. Nope. <laughs> I don't get Judas. I comments. know <laughs> she had some great comments. <laughs> oh, she can now raise her hand. Hand. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> She's been invited. <laughs> Hello. Hi, hey, Judith. <laughs> don't bait me like that, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let this one go, but all i got to say is um, I've seen this lovely space. You know, when we first got here, it was so beautiful. They had weddings there, and mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, it got to where I really couldn't bring guests in for Heritage Day uh, and house them there, and it made me sad. Um, I know uh, we have an old friend, Rusty Shoots, who's, he, he rented one of those cabins for his son for a graduation party. And I'm thinking, you know what? That's an asset. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, whatever they do to bring it up to code and bring it into more comfort, I'm all for it. It's a, and you remember Madeline Helling, her whole, you know, her whole railroad thing is down there. So there's a resource there that should be supported. Mm -hmm. And if they're upgrading, I'm for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Thumbs up. Um, okay, so any any discussion on on their? Proposal? I think it's pretty straightforward. Yep. I, I agree. So uh, I think uh, I think e aluminum or fiberglass, what, whatever works better, as long as it looks the yeah, same. I yeah. need a note here. We're gonna have to dig into that a little bit and mm -hmm. make, make that correct. Right when you get when you get to the permit yeah. phase, when you get into mm -hmm. more details, but there's there's I don't see any problems at all. Um, for myself. So, uh, motion to approve as? I move to approve as presented. Second. Okay, Commissioner Ermshark. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Van Zant. Yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right, Amy, I think uh, we're at uh, 300 Spring Street, right? No, we're at uh, 314. Oh, sorry, where did I get that address? Yeah, that's what I meant, but I read some other words there. I think I have to recuse myself from this one. All right, um, I'll, I'll have when we introduce it and you can kind of state it. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Thank you. Staff report here together. Okay. <laughs> you want me to just announce it? <laughs> so, well, this, this, so this is for um, item number six, 211 Commercial Street, conditional use permit for outdoor dining. All right, and due to the proximity of my business, uh, Little Rad Riding Hood, fur traders, I must recuse myself. Uh, 
I know. <laughs> Get started. So this is a, a use permit for site plan and architectural review to, um, or use permit site plan and architectural review entitlements to establish an outdoor dining area ancillary to the Three Forks a Bakery and Brewing Company Incorporated, and a variance request for the reduced parking standards. Um, so let's see. Background information: August fifteenth, two thousand thirteen, um, Planning Commission approved the exterior model of the subject buildings located behind the Alpha Building, uh, previously known as the Annex and Count Connector Buildings. There's really no description in our, uh, in our uh, historical ordinance other than um, when describing the Alpha Building, they um, refer to these buildings and say they are a full basement beneath the level of Broad Street, opens up upon a large parking lot. Oh, I should say that th this is actually on the adjacent parking lot, adjacent to where Three Forks is. Um, so that area is described. Uh, it's, it's the beneath the level of Broad Street that uh, opens up a large parking lot and storage area immediately in the area and facing open commercial street. The area office building and the prefabricated metal storage area, which is where Three Forks actually is now, uh, were added in 1964. So this application is for a use permit. Sorry, just bounced off where I was, um, a use permit to replace three off-street parking spaces with an outdoor dining area associated with the adjacent Three Forks business, um, and that's situated on the neighboring parcel. The applicant will improve the space by pouring a new concrete slab that will be flush with the walkway and ADA compliant, and will enclose the area with a metal rail consistent with the existing rail design that encloses their small, um, small outdoor patio um, space that's right up against their building. Uh, the property is within a base zoning district of general business, which allows for outdoor restaurant use with the approval of a conditional use permit. Um, existing use within the building on the neighboring parcel is already authorized as a brewery and restaurant business. Um, it's designated within our historical district. So some of the other issues around this one really have to do with the parking variance. So um, essentially with the um, the the area that they're expanding into and the reduced reduction of three parking spaces, that amounts to a, a new parking demand of, uh, that's equal to five parking spaces. So um, they're, they're essentially requesting a variance from our parking standards um, by that reduced five space amount. Um, lighting, they're, um, they're, they're, they're only lighting that they're proposing is a string lighting. Which um, and I'll show you. I'll show you what they're proposing here in just a minute. But there, it's a fully cut off uh, string light that um, that totally covers the the, the light source bulb. Dark sky compliant string lighting. I, I don't know if they have the has actually dark sky compliant, but I think that it would um, probably pass that know. muster. Uh, I don't the, know where Ridgeway is. Oh. Sorry. Did you, you, read, you read through I some read of the other. I've been through that. <laughs> I've been this way. Not too many people have. So. I've never. I'd never heard of it until I looked up. It, I did for my brewing apprenticeship. No, oh, really? Huh. Oh wow. Huh. Wow. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. I'll, I'll throw in that, that if the if the light source is shielded from a thirty degree deflection from a horizontal, it fits the bill. Uh, you know whether or not it. It has, has the words. I was really just baiting Tom. <laughs> Success. Uh, the advisory review committee did meet with the applicant on um, February 22nd. Uh, the committee discussed the furniture, furniture selections and the shade cover selection and asked that the form and material be more compatible with the furniture guidelines and the applicant has provided um, some updates to those and I'll, I'll provide the, um, the material that they selected. Uh, here and I'll show, put them up on the screen here in a minute, but um, they did uh, try to respond. The one other thing they responded to that was made at that meeting, a request made at that meeting was um, that the applicant indicated that Diedrich's cheese business owner had expressed a preference for the shade cover as opposed to the table umbrellas um, because they would be less obtrusive. I haven't actually received anything directly from them, but that was what the applicant had told me um, was the case. So, because um, that was a a concern of the advisory review committee that um, that one or the other might block uh, visibility of that business. Can I just offer a quick correction on that? Shauna mm -hmm. actually didn't talk to oh. Marie Deidre. She oh. talked to um, Denise, who's the manager oh. there. Okay. And that was her, her opinion. Okay. Yeah. 
Sorry, I misunderstood, I think. So this, or let me go up to one other. Oh, no, 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 it's down. Uh, this is essentially what the um, space will look like. Let me zoom in a little bit. The graphic of the place, and it's very, very dark, uh, the image that's up there, but the, their, existing, um, their existing enclosure will, will essentially be the same with the, the exception of the, they'll have some larger posts that will essentially hold the shades, the shade structure and the, um, the lighting. So that's where it will be. The entrance to Three Forks is here. Um, and it'll be these three, I keep pressing on things. Uh, three, three right in the front, adjacent to the sidewalk. will be where it would be enclosed. Now this is a, probably a better view of the existing. These are the string lights they're proposing. The bulbs fully the light shielded. source is shaded. Thank you. Um, so they did provide some, some options for different kinds of furniture. Um, I think at the advisor review meeting, Shauna had uh, expressed an interest in trying to have something that was easily movable for her staff. Um, so she felt these fit the, the bill there. So um, options for the planning commission to consider. And same with uh, table options. And then I'll zoom in on the, the shade structure because that was something that the advisory review committee had had some concerns about. They changed it from sort of a triangular shape to this it's sort of just a squared off rectangular shape. And that gray color, I think, the is the yeah. Match the color of the building. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's what I got. Um. So the the we should we should take this in pieces, right? The the variance application, um, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. And I don't did did we did we hear the. The just the justification or the, the nar narrative for the variance. For the variance, ask. I can yeah. I can uh, let me go back and try to remember what I wrote. <laughs> Hold on. Close this. Oops, stop sharing. Actually. Can you direct me to a page uh, for that? Yes, when I get to it. Okay. What are you looking for, Tom? The uh, the um, the, the statement range. that justifies the variance uh, request. I, I have a pair. It is page forty-two. Yeah. It's on page forty-two. Forty-two, and on the PDF. On the PDF, yeah. So that's yeah, that's what in the top the left. Paragraph I have for potential justification of the variance, and then the findings kind of come out of that. Um, <clears throat> So your purview is to take action on whether or not to grant the variance. Um, in this case, uh, staff is suggesting that the Planning Commission can find that the multitude of uses on the parcel restrict the ability of it for it to be fully parked for any one use and the adjacency of the subject area to the recently widened sidewalks, which support outdoor dining um, for other establishments provide, and provides a pedestrian friendly transition to lower commercial street as opposed to a parking area. And these may be considered special circumstances of the lot that deprives the property of privileges enjoyed by other businesses in the vicinity, most of which are built out to their property lines and don't have any kind of on-site parking. Um, commissioner can also find that the reduced parking does not grant a special privilege basically for that same reason because a lot, there's a bunch of businesses that don't have, that are not fully parked or have no parking. Is this also going to have to go to council? So council's purview is to approve the, an in lieu fee. So essentially they, ha they have to approve the, them to, uh, the ability for them to pay an in lieu fee before the, you guys grant the variance, but they have to um, allow them to pay an in lieu fee or can just require them to provide the parking. Okay. Uh, any other questions from uh, Rod or Peter? Um, 
I think we already addressed the uh, loss of parking with the idea that of allowing parklets, right? So we've, we've already kind of said we will trade parking for outdoor dining and uh, the last go around, so. Conceptually. Conceptually. Yeah. Par and parklets, they do have to, the, those are things that they have to sort of lease from the city. Those, they're a little different because this is a private property, so we're gonna lose the parking in perpetuity. They're, the parklets, they have to lease on an annual, annual, annual basis, I yeah. think. Yeah. But if, as long as they're operating, there's loss of parking. Right. And we've already kind of adjusted to that. Yeah. So I, I have anyway. let me ask another clarifying question. The parking lot is private. It's not taking from city parking. Correct. Okay, thank right. you. Okay. Right. And actually, if I may comment, Gary, Please. Gary Temple, uh, representing the owners, that parking lot uh, for the last 10 years, for all intents and purposes, has been a city parking lot. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I'm looking for, is some sort of compensation from the city for the last decade. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> like renegotiated in arrears for uh, losing all that money. Glad I left <laughs> my checkbook home. <laughs> and the, the spot we're proposing is where the tent was for you know, yeah. two or three years, yeah. and yeah. actually taking up one less spot. And we got uh, by without those parking spots during the COVID uh, dilemma, so that made everybody start thinking about, you know, let's upgrade and get some permanent outside there. I think I'm going to have to consult Peeps. <laughs> yeah, I don't look at Peeps, maybe I should. Okay, um, uh, were you going to say something else? No, go ahead. Um, and I... Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, I'm looking at the proposed patio shade cover. Uh, and the, there's a solid wall in the back. No. So, I think so it's is just, this, an just an example. It's just an example of the shade. Just of the shade. Just of the shade. Yeah. In, at the, okay, uh, I'm okay with that. Design idea. review, I think we were showing... Shauna was maybe showing three triangles mm -hmm. like we used to have at Robinson yeah. Plaza at right. times. Okay. And the comments were, you know, maybe something different than okay. the triangles. Well, I guess and, and that would be down then during rain events and stuff like that, right? It's It would be down during the winter season. Period. Basically. Yeah, period. Okay. I mean, it's, I mean, it makes the most sense in keeping it, you know, in good shape for years to come to not subject it to elements where it's not even going to be utilized anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, if we have a normal winter, um, it's not going to provide much seating outside anyway. And okay. This winter, probably okay. none at all. <laughs> I agree. Um, I guess maybe it's more a comment because we've already gone through the guidelines, but I, I have really appreciated having the outdoor dining the last few years, and it makes me a little sad that um, there isn't a compromise there that we could have. Uh, rain protection. I think to, I to, to, to clarify, though, because I, I asked a similar question, maybe this is this does the the guidelines apply to outdoor dining in the public right of way, which this is not correct. Yes. So the so guidelines they could propose a structure. Tents would still be difficult or impossible to meet um, some of the fire code standards, is what I understand. Mm -hmm. But um, there there could be a structure. So there's open space in the future for this discussion? If, if they wanted to, yeah. Okay. I mean, then that would go through architectural review. Great. If I may comment, one of the reasons we're showing this you know, fairly unobtrusive single plane shade cover is in consideration of the neighboring businesses, Dedricks sure. and yeah. CBD above, because yeah. when the tent was there, or even umbrellas, the visibility of those businesses is, is blocked pretty severely. Mm -hmm. So this way, you know, the, we propose to hang the shade sail at about 10 feet, so there should be a clear sight line to the other businesses. And, the, and, that, in, the, and that information from Diedrich's Cheese, is that's, that's very good information to have, like what their preference is in terms of mm -hmm. what's less like obstructive to their view. Yeah. And, and at the advisory review committee, just for, this is for uh, uh, Amy's um, information, uh, it, it, it made sense that 
provisions for outdoor dining there should be consistent with the aesthetic of the, um, or harmonious anyway, with the aesthetics of the uh, um, standards in the dining in the right of way, mm -hmm. so that it all looks like we're in the same city. That's just to catch you up on that. Um, okay, so uh, any other questions no. for this aspect? Uh, time for public comment? City manager. We've only got two public, but uh, they look like they're. Can we love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone in uh, on Zoom wants to uh, make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand, and we do have one. Judith, you can go ahead and address the commission. You just gotta know, I just came up a big job. I'm really tired and a little bored, so <laughs> I came on here because I haven't been on this site for a while or listened to you for a while, but this is important. Um, that whole part of the bottom of Commercial Street is kind of in play in a well to me. It's just, for me, it's got so much potential. What's going to happen is our courthouse will empty out to the new courthouse out on the highway, and so will that Bank of America building. Now, back in the day when I was idealistic and stupid, I thought that I should grab that with some help from the community and do some of the Amaral, Dixieland jazz, you know, make it a real, you know, just a real cool corner to be on where he would be plating great food like he always did. And we would have this very cool, like, jazz situation, you know, and, and uh, didn't happen. Um, what, what has to happen is probably, what's going to happen to that building when everybody moves out to the highway that's in our government? And we're going to have the courthouse and that building. So all I'm, I'm not trying to suggest anything to anybody, but I was interested a, a long time ago in the Alpha building because, you know, it was proposed as a kind of a marketplace. And I'm also going to say that little SPD out there is groaning under the weight of all the increased traffic and people and regulations. Um, I'm saying this because I had a little fender bender there recently, and it, it was so sad because that parking lot needs help, that whole area, and no one's focused on that. So we get to priorities. I just, I'm just going to wait and see what all of you do and what the city decides to do. As far as this goes, I would give three forks everything they're asking for, and, uh, and Melissa at the Bistro, uh, uh, they're struggling so hard to keep up with the, the masses of people that you are inviting here for, with no parking to accommodate, and not you, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, that's a really horrible, but the city, you know, like, that's our, that's where we're going. We need to shift our focus. I don't know how to do that, but all I'm saying is I'm, I'm for her, for her proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Not that uh, I have. Um, what did you? Uh, what? That's that's all we have for. Us. Okay. Um, any commission discussion at this point? Uh, and and uh, should we should we consider uh, the uh, the variance first and then uh, uh, other aspects separately? H how should we do that? Yeah, walk through them one by one. So and we'll so, as separate motions. Uh, what that? Or we can just say yes and bundle them together. But I mean, consider them separately. So Why don't we, just I think through. we should take them at uh, each entitlement. And then also do CEQA at the beginning, so I can and I can. I'm happy to read through my recommended motions, and then uh, we we could discuss the design elements. Oh, oh yeah. First, before we yes. get, get to motions. Sorry, I thought you were saying you're ready. No, to start I'm just our uh, <laughs> uh, asking for my guidance as to how we proceed from here. Um, any discussion on the on the uh, shade structure or the um, uh, preference of seating or tables? Okay. Uh, we've got an option. Well, we got the lights. I, mean, I agree with the lights. Lights look great. Um, my thought was I went down to the table, option A, table, and the chairs that are shown in that picture seem to seem, well, they're compatible with the table, obviously. Um, and the middle one, the B, is kind of similar, but uh, are those, are those, uh, the, the tables, I like the table A, 
Um, and are those chairs available? Yeah. Or is okay. that, I know it's just a sound, uh, you know. The, the, the A mayor. options are, we're shown, are what we should, well, that's our preference, so is, is chair option A and table option A as well. Oh. I oh, also prefer oh, those. so the separate chairs are, okay. Got chairs my. without that, without the armrests or we only have one that okay. doesn't have them, but that's preferable. So if, if we like option A, we get the table and the chairs? They're sold separately. I like it. I they like it. Yeah, sure no, from our standpoint, yes. yes. I like yeah. I like the combination. So that's where I was going with it. Sold separately. Uh, some assembly required. And they have to be stackable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other seat? Chair option A. Chair option Chair option C. I'm presuming is steel. Uh, yeah, they're all metal. Um, so they're, what did it say? It was, it was so coated, coated, coated steel. Coated steel. And steel. I think yeah. they're all the same. Um, yeah, the uh, option uh, C is steel, just. What I like about A is that it's easiest to clean. Oh, good point. Mm -hmm. And it also looks like it's going to be easiest for their staff to stack and move. Yeah, that seems seems clear. Also, light, light, and really easy to orient into a stacked. Uh, I, I also think option B is probably the least <laughs> favorable of these. Yeah, it's very be, contemporary. Looking. It's very contemporary looking. It looks like it could be. I realize that it's uh, resin. It's well, I take that back. It's not steel. It is resin. So Ooh. it does look like a plastic chair because it is a plastic chair. <laughs> is there any benefit to have it match the ones in Robinson Plaza? I mean, just for continuity's sake or for the kind of the look of the town? I personally am not wedded to that, given the distance between the two and such, so. Yeah. It, ma matching, matching is not required and not always a benefit either, so. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be a zoned off area by itself, I think. Right. So, I'm okay with it. It, well, it's just a, kind of oh, an off-trail discussion, but but uh, um, but to answer that, um, they intend to take the chairs in, stack them on a regular basis, and the the the, uh, the ones in Robinson Plaza are steel and heavy and really hard. I mean, it's it's a from a practical standpoint, it would be it would be unfriendly. Uh, or yeah, we'd have yeah. higher turnover. I, yeah, right. I never tried to stack the ones around as a black, so I, I don't know all of them. Weightlifters may apply. Yeah. yeah. So just just finish on my comments on the Sorry. design elements. Um, yes, yeah, so that I guess that's my comments on the table and chairs. Uh, the I appreciate the square struck the square shape sale. I I think that's more appropriate than the uh, overlapping triangles. And uh, I also uh, appreciate that the lights are full cut off and uh, reduce the uh, spillover and noise pollution. So kudos on all those things. That's it for me. Okay. Um, it seems like, yeah, it's a really, really good adjustment. Looks um, okay. Uh, any Good with the shade structure? Great with the shade, shade structure. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> um, all right, well, let's, let's start the process of m making motions. Okay, give me one second. First recommendation is to determine that the project is categorically exempt from environmental review pursuant to section 15301E of the California Envi Environmental Quality Act. Guidelines for projects characterized as existing facilities. I'm sorry, it should be infill. Sorry, hold on. Uh, oh no, sorry. Infill is what we use for, um, sorry. It feels a, a, a little bit harder standard. So yeah, I did, it, this one qualified for the existing facilities. Apologies. Uh, 
uh, characterized as existing facilities, including additions to existing structures, provided that the addition will not result in an increase of more than 50% of the floor area of the structure before the addition where public services are available and the area is not environmentally sensitive. I'll make the motion to approve it as stated. A second. Okay, and Commissioner Cobden. Yes. Sorry, I don't usually start with you. Commissioner Van Zandt. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Motion passes four to zero. See how versatile we are. <laughs> <laughs> did you say yes? I did. Oh, good. I did. Okay. Uh, approve the proposed use permit subject to conditions of approval, making <coughs> findings A through C pursuant to section 17.88.20 of the Nevada, I think it's 020 of the Nevada County Municipal Code. So moved. This is just, this doesn't include the parking, right? Okay, yeah. Got it. It's not, no, the variance will be for the parking. Okay, got it. Um, so Peter moved. <laughs> I'll second it. And Commissioner Van Zandt. Sure. Commissioner Brown. Yes. yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Okay. Commission approves the variance request for reduced parking, making findings A and B pursuant to section 17.88.030 of the City Municipal Code. If we, if we could, I think our comments before were on the aesthetics. If I could make a brief <laughs> comment here on the parking, I just. Uh, support, you know, the I think this is a generally higher use of our city spaces, you know, along the lines of uh, what Judith said. Um, although parking is necessary, you know, we need it for uh, tourism and visitors and such that you know, a place like this, which is essentially in one of the hearts of our uh, our historic district, uh, this is a much better use of that. It accommodates many more people uh, in terms of that. So let me get that stated. The variance well, is well justified. Exactly. I, in I think that was really well put, Rod. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And, and going back to an earlier discussion, looking up the hill towards the courthouse, the chances are we're going to pick up a parking lot or two. Oh, we don't know, Peter. <laughs> we don't know what's going to happen. I know, but I'm saying that would be a possibility depending on what goes in there. And back That's to true. the matter at hand. <laughs> the future's wide open. <laughs> Ooh, do you know something we don't know? I know all kinds of things. <laughs> I move to approve the variance. Second. Commissioner Van Zandt. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Knight. Yes. Motion passes. Two more. Okay. Commission approves the site plan subject to conditions of approval as may be modified at the public hearing, making or pursuant to section 17.88.010 of the city municipal code, making finding A in the staff report. I'll move for approval of this. Second. Commissioner Van Zandt. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Chair, or Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Nye. Yes. Last one. The Planning Commission, uh, acting as Architectural Review Committee, approves Architectural Review application as conditioned for the proposed outdoor enclosure located at 211 Commercial Street, making findings A and B in the staff report. Uh, for table for table table and chair option B, should we throw that in there? Wait, uh, table and chair option A. A, A, sorry. Findings A and B. I had the wrong. I, I meant I meant what you said, but that's not what I said. <laughs> you got our attention. <laughs> it was a test. Are they listening? Uh, uh, so moved. I'll second. And Commissioner Van Zandt. Yes. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Vice Chair Cobden. Yes. Chair Knight. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, and and. Uh, uh, it's, it, just seem, I, I, it just seems to me we should have a liaison on this project, and uh, I would like to appoint Amy Cobden, if willing. Sure. And so any, any small changes you need, uh, you contact Amy Wolfson, Amy Cobden, uh, we'll talk to you, and he, so, so she, she'll be able to make small change approvals 
uh, and you won't have to come back to uh, the uh, commission if any if you discover any you know unexpected okay. like like some like a, some some product isn't available or something yeah. like that you need exactly. to change. Okay, yeah. great. Congratulations, Amy. If I may ask, what's the uh, time frame of the to get city council this parking variance we issue? Probably get you on in April, but we got to discuss what we're going to do. So let's okay. uh, let's let's have a meeting. And April, what what day of the? I mean, what? I mean, what's the the, 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 April, the, April, the next the first uh, meeting in April would be the twelfth, or the second meeting would be the twenty sixth. Okay. So. Because yeah, we're trying to get this thing in operation by yeah. summer. So. Let's meet soon. We should next. We'll chat next. Week. Nice addition, guys. Nice. It's going to be nice. Makes sense, I think. Yeah. Yep. yeah it does. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll Thank be you. talking yeah. about our minor changes because of availability of materials. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll keep it. That sounded yeah. ominous, Gary. Well, you never know nowadays as far as events. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. You try to order so, 28 so of one item. Supply chain. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you. Thanks a lot. We'll talk soon. Yeah. Good. good seeing you, Peter. Good seeing you. Now what? I would like to suggest a brief recess. I can do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> Oh.
we're now back in session. Tap, tap. Um, the next item. What is it? Item seven, uh, discussion of dark sky outdoor lighting standards. So uh, at the February 16th meeting, the Planning Commission requested that staff add a discussion item regarding the drafting of a citywide dark sky ordinance. Um, I've attached the International Dark Sky Association community guidelines, as well as the lighting ordinance um, that was recently amended for the community of Ridgeway, Colorado. Uh, which is a small incorporated foothill town and uh, there's there were some ordinance that were pretty convoluted this one seemed really straightforward so i really i liked it um, and they had sort of similar demographics they're like a town of 1000 but they're a little foothill town um they they uh, got certified by the international dark sky uh, association in 2020 after amending their ordinance um, some things that the commission may want to consider are things like the perimeter lighting um, in downtown and uh, or things that will have to be have to come up when we're actually drafting it if if that comes to fruition can i just clarify what you, what you're calling perimeter lighting per, oh i'm calling the bulbs on the outside mm -hmm. of the, the historic district gotcha okay um, thank you yeah that's what i call perimeter like uh, to be clear, outlining the, the, buildings. the buildings. Yeah. The, okay. The kind of oh, yeah. Christmas exterior light. roof line lighting. Okay. Color. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> Since we're the uh, supposedly purveyors of the whole thing. You're in charge of it. It's your, yeah. your thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's all I have. I'm happy to bring up any of the um, things on the screen from the guidelines, from the Dark Sky Association guidelines, um, or any Ridgeview standards. Uh, but essentially, what will have to happen is um, we'll, we'll have to get, we'll take this item to city council if that's what you guys uh, would like for me to do, and get their um, their buy-in to actually have staff drafting ordinance, which would then come back to you for kind of um, I'd like to take the process a little out of order because we have yeah. Stuart Baker here, um, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, um, to make a public comment. Thank you, Chair and I. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we see this as an opportunity to market Nevada City in the way I think all of us here really want to market this town for tourism. Um, if you've ever looked at a map of the United States, we are actually in a region of the country that is actually contains dark sky versus like LA or even the Central Valley, you know, I mean, we are really in an area because we're in where we are in the Sierras, us and like the center of Nevada are our dark sky areas to begin with. So we see this as a wonderful opportunity to um, differentiate ourselves from some other neighboring communities that we won't mention, but you know, we, we, we're darker in our skies than a lot of places around. And I just think it, it just adds to our, um, to, to where we'd like to go in terms of marketing ourselves environmentally and the outdoor community that loves us. So it just fits in perfectly. So uh, the chamber supports it. We're happy to, through our merchant meetings, uh, promote it and talk to it, use that as an opportunity to have folks give us feedback. If they have concerns, we are happy to do surveys with property owners like we do with the exterior roof line lights as well. Um, that would just be one thing. I know we're in a process, I'm gonna be presenting to the business committee of the, um, uh, the city council about expanding the time that the exterior roof line lights are happening because there has been a lot of support for that. So that this has to somehow work within that and that's just something to consider because it does feel like if it's a popular vote that it would be voted on to expand it. Um, so that would be one thing to discuss. And then uh, lastly, I'm just kind of curious, I know that the post office next door has incredibly bright light, <laughs> lights at night in their parking lot. And uh, I know that since they're a federal agency, I'd be just curious to know if the, an ordinance like this have, has any purview there. Uh, or any, uh, any any ability, because that would be a, a really key part of the downtown. So, 
to see about uh, making adjustments to if it's possible. And I know that there have been safety concerns there, but again, th this is about the, s the lights going up towards the sky, you know, and not maybe as much towards the ground. But anyway, those are the only comments I have. Any questions on chamber, et cetera? Nope. I, I, do, I do have a, I have a question. Uh, uh, they, uh, the, the business owners would like to ex expand uh, the use of the, uh, the outline lighting, perimeter lighting, beyond all the time? <laughs> yeah, well, that's part of the problem. So we were tasked, long before I ever started, with the role of being the, um, the police in this case. But we have no ability to come down and if anyone doesn't comply. So we're just left to send things out like, you know that they should be turned off now, and you know they should be turned on now, and generally there are rule followers and there are rule breakers, and nothing has really been happening. So, uh, and there are forgetful bears. Yeah, exactly. And there's complicated situations in every bears. sense. So this is, this is what we're, we're faced with, and um, you know, it would be nice, and that's a discussion with, with council as well, whatever we decide to either give us the ability to have, to have some teeth in when we make the request or to adjust the ability for us or have it come from somewhere else. I don't know. Because it, it is not working right now, honestly, because it's just it's really hard. Uh, this fall, I had to send about four emails out to get everyone's lights on so the lighting consultant could come out and look and make sure that all the bulbs are in place and all the light fixtures or systems are working. And so that was, it's, it takes a lot more time than one realizes to just get the word out, so. Mm -hmm. and, and would you discuss it with, uh, with business owners, D discuss a dark skies idea? Sure, I, I, I would discuss that probably separately because we see this as a really positive initiative and the whole roof line lighting thing is a little more I don't want to say controversial, but I don't want to confuse the two or tie the two together because I think people honestly should be in support of this um, uh, uh, independently of that and make a decision on each topic and figure out how. I mean, Sean just had mentioned that there are um, our compliant lighting, that is dark sky compliant lighting for the purposes that we have that I guess, I don't know, would the bulbs kind of go just kind of like not up or? Yeah, they have an enclosure over them. An, an enclosure, but that would be an immense cost and I don't see it in this current economy, et cetera, but just down the road. I so. think I read something too, um, that some of the strategies for um, outdoor lighting that maybe is projecting out, I forget the terminology for, for that, but um, is even something like the lights um, get turned off two hours after sunset, like some of that kind of well, stuff. They're turned, they're can't you, what about just, just putting them in a yeah. timer? That's, like, that's can, what I'm saying. Can, as like a city, can we just provide a timer to every well, business uh, you, that has an outlet and then? It, it's again, it's another herding cats thing. I mean, a lot of people are on timers. A lot of people have systems that are so janky that timers won't even work. I mean, I've heard that. <laughs> oh my yeah. goodness. So it's, you know, sure, it's standardized, but that then brings you to 20th century. Do we need a know, committee? Electrical outlets yeah. and things. It's, it's uh, I've heard every situation brought to me and it's unfortunately very uh, not uniform. Hmm. Just, and Wendy's comment too. I, one question I had for you was the the International Dark Sky Association guidelines here have uh, a restriction there. Sign illumination shall be mm -hmm. extinguished completely one hour after sunset and remain off until one hour before sunrise. Is that something that you expect to have pushback? I would absolutely expect to have pushback on <laughs> yeah. that to that degree. And, and I don't, I've never been through the process of getting the certification. And so I don't mm -hmm. know what, what is entirely entailed. I, I thought it was more on, on appropriate lighting, but if it's on actual practices, that would both. take it to it's a both. Yeah. But yeah, also, so. what, I'm not sure if I, I read that as well. And like, what is sign illumination? So is like sign illumination, like a light up sign on the front of Staples? versus a little hanging wooden sign that has a light pointed at it, right? It, the definition in the footnote is eliminated by either internal or external means. So it would be okay. both. Yeah. 
But yeah. I, and my understanding is that, 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 those, that those like limitations, like the, 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 the lighting has to t turn off with, within or by a half hour, the language is so clunky, yeah. but that's lighting that doesn't uh, meet dark skies that, that do create sky glow or, or the light source is visible. So it's essentially non-compliant lighting. And that also- was, That wasn't clear to me. That wasn't clear to me. Oh, right. that was my sense of it. But then we're, we, we could be in a position to- We should, we should have that clarified. And also way. what yeah. about if the business is open? Right, that's so where I'm going. That, you know, it's like the, if the business the is point. closed, that seems pretty simple. But if the business is open, yeah. then you know. Well, so. we're, and then yeah, figuring out what, if we have to follow everything to the letter to have a certification, because I know a lot of certifications. If you have eight points out of ten or whatever, and I, yeah. again, I don't know how. This I think works. I think the key point of this will have to be addressed as we're yeah. going yes. through this process. So, so the so the, there there will be if if we if we do agree to. Um, uh, uh, request the city council provide direction to staff to create a draft ordinance. Then there's opportunities to work with the business community. Um, Absolutely, and we yeah, would coordinate in, in, that in for, drafting the, or, in for drafting the city the ordinance. to yeah. do that. Yeah, so okay. make sure that we have everything that people would feel good about or at least informed about. Well, we have bars and restaurants open well after. Uh, Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. right, no, it's true. So uh, I think those things would need to be addressed. And, you know, so we'll see. All right. Thank you, Stuart. Sure. Thanks, Thank Stuart. And since, the, is it a, um, so now that we've done a public comment period, shall we request oh, any yeah. further public comment oh, at this yeah, time? Yeah. Zero Aww. attendees on oh, it. Heck, well, um, uh, is there any further uh, presentation that we want from? I will just note that Ridge, Ridgeway did have a, um, they had some accept, uh, yeah. accept, exceptions or exemptions? I can't remember. Exa yeah, I think exceptions. Right. But, so they did allow holiday lighting for a period of time. And it's, so our, our holiday lighting, which is the perimeter lighting, um, is supposed to be from, I think, January 15th, or November 15th to January 15th. So they had a similar ex exemption for holiday lighting. So there are ways to do it, but I don't know what the, how temporary temporary has to be in order to be in line with the certification. Um, well, shall we get any discussion or questions? Uh, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of material to read, like that. Right. The, yeah. Uh, well, I guess my question is like, how much of a how much pre work and what is the right amount of presentation to make sure this is success a success with council that they go yeah we we agree we think that's a good idea you know like who who puts that package together how does it get to them I don't understand this well I would right the staff would, report yeah and if, if, I mean I would essentially just say this is something that um, planning commission is has asked um, to pursue and... And so um, would that include like why we think it's important? I mean, is that it, part of can, what we yeah, need to iterate like to you? A, yeah. I Supporting think arguments. Yeah. 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 yeah, you know, so in terms of um, even just looking at our strategic priorities that have recently been flushed out in the vibrancy committee, mm -hmm. when I think of the word vibrancy, I think of the well-being of the community and so in addition to you know um, appreciating the stars, there was a crazy statistic that 60% of Americans cannot see the Milky Way, 30% of Americans can't even see the sky anymore because of light pollution, and so certainly you know it's fun to stargaze and um, we have outdoor enthusiasts and so forth, but it's actually a matter of of health, and so they're finding um, I'm not you know I'm not a scientist, but I like to read. And um, so there's data that's very available, which talks about the disruption to melatonin production, hormone regulation, sleep cycle. And then in turn, you know, those disruptions contribute to things like depression, anxiety, and cancer. And so to me, this is also about the well-being of our community. Um, it's also about being um, in integrity with our ecosystem, right? And so, um, 
uh, pollinators, migratory birds, even just um, you know sending nocturnal signals, animals. nocturnal animals, sending signals to plants of when to blossom and bloom and so forth, it's, it's essential. So those are some of the whys in my opinion. I have a few comments. <laughs> um, uh, in addition to, I think Wendy made some great points there about human health and environmental health and effect on the environment and animals and those sorts of things. I think that was well said. I'd also note uh, that I think there's a mistaken understanding or assumption by many people that brighter light is safer light and more illumination is better. If you've ever been driving down the highway and somebody's headlights are shining in your face, and over illumination can actually, you know, reduce visibility and uh, make things less safe. Um, along those lines, I think, uh, and I think the dark sky guidelines had some of this in there, an education, education component of this is going to be important, especially if it's going to be accepted by the community. Um, so those are a couple points. Um, I appreciated the comment too about government buildings. It'd be great to understand as we go forward with this how that applies to uh, the post office and other things that are. Yeah. I mean, certainly, certainly the city's building. I don't know if we could. I, 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 I think just to note it when you're putting things together and to understand what that impact is. You don't know if you can control the post office. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should ask a second question to the council. Well, I, think, I, think, I think it's also the county, too, right? Because the county buildings are. Right. So I think the question would be how that applies to the county buildings, too. Generally, I think they are. But they, might, but they might want to. Want it would be it would be good to re if they're exempted, it'd be good to reach out. I would love to. I would love to inspire to yeah. 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 look at the light pollution, pollution map. Has anybody map? seen, anybody that? seen yeah. that? Yeah. And so, yeah. And so I, mean, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense. You'd assume, you'd assume so, but like Grass Valley is obviously contributing, you know, even more. And we just have one little hill, you know, that separates. And so that glare, that reflective light on the clouds, even if even as we become dark sky compliant, like, you know, hopefully our neighbors want to do it too, you know. I'd also note that just in my, you know, I moved here in 2006, I remember a friend had a telescope and he brought it and we set it up on our deck at the time. And it was great, you could see lots of stuff. You know, since that time, you know, now that I have three neighbors mm -hmm. with bright lights that, you know, glare in, I mean, this is just, I see outside my kitchen window now, you know, um, and I don't think it's, you know, malicious or anything, I just think people don't understand. So um, I think it's important to do this. Also, on a related note, I think this is uh, becoming almost a competitive thing among communities. And in my work yesterday, um, I was working with a client in Mariposa County, and I asked about issues that were coming up, and this is all transportation related. And they raised dark skies as uh, an issue there that's becoming very big in their community. So I think our timing on this is very good. That's great. And what do we think would be reasons people would not be in favor of this? Obviously, what is the expense to their fixtures or renovations? I think that could be an obstacle, but um, I think that I think that's a key thing. And also, like the the, the model ordinance here included a phase in period, so yeah. I think we'll have to carefully address that too and consider that. So to that, and I I I, I, I try to think in, in in compassionate terms about people who yeah. favor really bright, outward-directed yeah. lighting. And I think especially people who, who have come maybe from suburbs. Right. Yeah. They're um, used to it. They're, 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 um, and I lived, I lived on, I don't want to go too far afield here, but in very rural eastern Long Island where it was dark. And a lot of the people who came for the weekends lived in New York City. That used to happen here. Where there is no nighttime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and they, they're terrified by yeah. the darkness. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, so people may, may feel safer with brighter outward facing light. And I, and I did a little research, just very cursory, about um, um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania it is, a, is a dark skies city. Really? And they, they repeat, they, they they report no increase in crime rate um, by reducing the outward directed light. Um, there's plenty of lighting still available in like pedestrian areas, of course, because it's controlled, uh, like where you're walking, w areas that need to be seen are seen are lit, um, but there's no increase in crime rate. 
uh, at least as far as I have found so far. So, um, uh, so there'd have to be some education regarding, like, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a false sense of security, at least statistically speaking. And, and for the person who's going, well, I don't feel unsafe about the boogeyman. I feel unsafe like I can't see where I'm going. And so the, the point is that the lighting will still direct and give you visibility Correct. to Down. safely yep. walk. Yes. I think that this is a good opportunity to be considerate of how we communicate the intention and the outcome. Yeah. Um, because I can think of a number of people in my life who would, I'm sure, appreciate this this effort, but who also would make note of the fact that they have trouble seeing driving or backing up or doing who knows whatever. Um, I think that being clear about what the outcome is going to be and how things will change is really important. So maybe, you know, when you hear dark sky, people might go, oh no, there's going to be less light to see. And, and perhaps, but it's, it's not even necessarily as much about less light as it is directing the light in the right places. Mm -hmm. um, right? Yeah. I mean, is that, is that, it's, 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 a big it's keeping the useful light and eliminating the that, light that goes off that into space actually, that is not useful. And it's confusing. It's and targeted it's light. Light. Targeted, yeah. yeah. And, and, from, and to, to Rod's point regarding uh, safety, um, for example, I'm afraid Grass Valley is installing some, uh, there, there are new lights, and they're beautiful, very traditional looking light posts around the roundabout at East Main Street, and now uh, going down um, Dorsey Drive toward East Main Street off the freeway. Um, and there are a lot of them, um, and the, the luminaires they've installed have have uh, uh, like protrude, downward protruding bulbs, uh, clear lenses, and the bulbs have LEDs directed outward. I won't be able to. I won't be able to drive. I won't be able to see. Yeah, it's very yeah. difficult. For so it looks like a lot of light. It looks yeah. like a good value, it's like cost per lumen. Yeah. Hmm? What was the governing body that chose them? I, I don't know. I, uh, and it, uh, but. But essentially, the effect is like I can't see. To, right. I can't see right. to navigate this roundabout because there's so much light in my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's just a, you know, to, yeah. to your that's point. A, yeah. And then I'll, 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 I'll share a little story that that I, that I mentioned at a advisory review committee meeting when my when my nephew Taylor came to visit me for the first time, maybe maybe 10 years ago here in Nevada City, he'd never been here before, um, after eventually finding the house. He pulls up in front and I was like, I'm like, hello, nephew, and he's all, <gasps> and he looks and he just drops everything, goes out in the middle of the street and says, mm -hmm. stars. Yes. Because oh, wow. he comes from Los Angeles and you don't just see stars when you look up in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, in the sky from the street. Yeah. Since then, some my neighbors have yeah. many neighbors have added outward directed very bright lights, and not and me, no, mm -hmm. not me. And I have some neighbors who are very considerate about their outdoor lights, yep. and when they're on. Um, Sometimes, I and actually, your your comment about the, the Grass Valley lights too. I think as we go through this process, you know, for the city to come up with a way to address its own lighting, I'm thinking about. It's stuff that, you know, potentially could be seen as meeting, but not effectively doing it. I'm thinking about the example in Argyle. You have those, you have uh, lights that are technically fully underneath the shade, but you have these angled glass panes. And I frequently walk down there early in the morning and it, the reflection, it's a direct reflection right into, you know, your eyes. So as part of this, I hope the, that, uh, it's a lens, like they have a lens. It's not a lens. It's just it's just a flat plane to resemble sort of a traditional luminaire, oh. but just the way it works out is you've got these bright LEDs and you have a uh, an angled uh, plate of glass that reflects out directly into your eyes. You can I mean you you can see a mirror image of the LEDs. Hmm. But anyway, I think it's important just that the city you know reflect its values in its own lighting it, it, for, it, so as a as a like a supportive argument to the to the city council though to yeah you know bring my nephew's experience home 
we are we still have this resource available to us. Sure. It's not too far gone, um, and it's 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 an attainable goal uh, that. Um, the, and then the, the sample ordinance from Ridgeway uh, has language that that um, that provides a roadmap essentially for. Uh, phasing out non-compliant light, lighting that isn't too onerous on homeowners, businesses, etc. And um, so it's a, it's a resource we have that we can still we can still have. I also and think that there's an interesting. I I'm still thinking about what Stuart said about the lack of consistency in um, I guess electric systems amongst businesses or the potential there. And I think that if it's really that difficult to put all of the external lights into individual timers, that's highlighting a big problem and potentially a safety hazard that should be addressed. Well, I mean, I don't really know the source of that though, because it could just be that somebody doesn't want to spend the money. Well, it could no. be that simple. It's just not a priority or, it you could know. be, but I like if, if it's something where like they can't simply plug their external lights into a standard plug, there's a lot of like very outdated electrical systems in town having, I think a number of us having shopped for homes recently enough, we're all familiar with the potential hazards there. A friend of mine is in a house that's like relatively updated but had an electric fire while no one was home recently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the kind of thing that many of us, myself included, don't really take seriously or think about until something like that happens. So perhaps it's also uh, an opportunity to um, to revisit those hmm. those potential issues. I don't know that they exist, but it just made me wonder. From a fire state, from a fire safety standpoint. From a fire safety downtown. standpoint, yeah, absolutely. From a procedural standpoint, we're being we're asking them to authorize us to develop a dark sky program. Yep. And should we, or we could put in there, or you could put in here, that, we, that the outcome would be dark skies, but recognizing safety and recognizing safety and health uh, environment. commercial interest or something of that nature, so that we would incorporate those. If, if the city council agrees, that would offset some of the um, maybe neg negative comments, and they haven't even seen a, a, a draft at that point. Yeah. So uh, keep it very general. Yeah. But we want, Sean, you think that would be? I think whatever is you think is best, um, you certainly could send a representative to present this to the council mm. um, mm. if you would prefer versus, I'm not, it's not a slam on Amy by any means, but she's taking down your intent. It may yeah. be better for you to that's, directly express that's your intent. That's a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. To work together. I nominate the chair. Yeah. yeah. I think the chair should work with the planner. <laughs> Does okay. the chair want to? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And that would mean that you could work with Amy on what we present in the staff report, the verbiage, that kind of thing, so that they're preheated to what your intent is. Preheated. And then you can expand yeah. upon that in the meeting. Did you as opposed to, I said preheated. You know, yeah. Yeah. Hands up. And you can refine it as opposed to all Amy can do is watch the, yeah. the YouTube yeah. of this and regurgitate it. what you yeah. come up with, but you might change or want to refine it. Could we have a right. PowerPoint deck? Just like, you know, five slides for a visual. Um, I think our liaison can handle that. Yeah, so, our liaison yeah. can do it. <laughs> maybe, maybe there should be a co-presenter. <laughs> A conversant in, uh, I, I want to just Joint for the meeting, all five of you can talk. Yay. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, Yay. <laughs> line up the table and, 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 um, I, I, I want to point out one, another aspect of the dark skies thing in case you missed it. This is for the benefit of the commission, um, that, uh, the, the dark skies, um, group uh, specify a light temperature of 3,000 Kelvin or under. Um, so, uh, and, and I personally, in, in looking at the city, um, so much outdoor lighting is in so much different, so many different color temperatures. There's a purpley blue, and then there's very, very white, and then there's 
then there's a like warmer uh, colors. And if we could unify the color temperature of our, of our outdoor lighting, it would become way less um, yep. visible. We wouldn't notice it as a thing. It would just be a warmly lit, uniformly warmly lit town. More from, soothing. Right. Um, the, the, the retrofit lights that you don't like all so much along Argyle Way are 3,000 K. Mm -hmm. The color, the, the color temperature of the light is very nice. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it has a, a warm, almost incandescent color, yeah. so, so it also Colors unifies. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the color's okay, that's yeah, not yeah. my concern but about it, you, <laughs> So if we were to do that, we, we would unify the, the, the light color of the whole city. There's some really interesting, um, like I saw in, oh, I wanna say it was Berlin, they have an example of how they're doing dark sky compliant lighting mm -hmm. using um, alternative styles of light bulbs that are creating almost this very amber light, which, you know, some people don't care for, but there's a lot of different ways that it's being approached too, so that you you get a broader illumination than just like really funneled down, but it's not disruptive to, you know, the, the light wave frequencies that are really reflective off the sky or distracting, you know, mig migrators, things like that, so. When, when I was doing some research on this, oh. I found this good graphic about the light temperatures. Yeah. Okay. One more comment too about sort of the retrofitting of the existing. I mean, one thing that might be considered is the the city waves fees for a lot of things. And if <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if 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 the we could potentially this is just a idea, but like deduct you know money spent towards these retrofits from fees or something along those lines. Or research and see if there's some other kind of like national. Incentive. Or if there's other if there's other financial support, even better. Yeah. Or tax PG &E. tax reductions. PG&E rebates. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, but you mean it? Yeah. Well, I was in, about to get so snarky. Yeah. There might be something though. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah, there could be. Also to note, I had a conversation with Brian McAllister regarding. Uh, 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 let's see, installing retrofit cutoff devices on the PG&E streetlights. And they, they exist. Um, appliances that attach to the existing new PG&E, newer LED streetlights. And- Which ones uh, are the PG&E streetlights? All, all of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> all, all the new ones that are just really small. Yeah, and really like, bright. Yeah, yeah, really bright. Yeah. Uh, but, but actually in, in not a terrible color temperature, it's probably 4,000 K. But, but uh, we can request, um, uh, we can request that PG&E install those for a fee per oh. fixture, but but the street lights can be brought into compliance too. It's a it's a it's a budget item though. Mm. Um, but that but that's a possibility because they are retrofitable. So that's a goal of uh, that we could work on in the dark skies um, process of uniform a more uniform light temperature. Mm -hmm. Throughout the business area, is that what you're saying? Well, dark skies. The, the dark skies um, uh, uh, organization is, says all lighting has to be three thousand K or below, or or warmer. Um, so that's that's right out the door. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the PG&E, the retrofit for full cutoff appliances or, or uh, um, you know adapters for the street lights are available. Mm -hmm. They just need to be requested and go into place, and they install them. I know too that I was uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Oro Valley, which is a suburb of Tucson. Very sprawling, yes. giant suburb, um, which is, I, I, I guess I could say horrible in many ways, but um, there are a couple of good things about it. They have bike lanes, and also it was built with, you know, this lighting in place from the beginning. Yes. I had that same memory. Yeah. I was like, I, I think Tucson was dark sky compliant yeah, because of the telescopes very, that are there. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and and the it feels good. It feels very good, you Doesn't know. It? Uh, yeah. And also, once everything's in place, there are a couple here and there that were not compliant, and boy, those jumped out at really? you when they weren't compliant. Yeah. But I mean, it's doable, and it makes a big difference in a giant sprawling place like that. How would you describe the feeling? Um, just much nicer like relaxed calming, relax, calming yeah, right calming. Yeah, that's how i yeah. felt it was like it's yeah. so calming yeah, yeah. Hmm. 
uh, and I, w I won't name this person by name, but a local astronomer um, uh, uh, expressed support for this in an email. And, and as, as, as it moves forward, uh, this local astronomer would, would be happy to support the effort. Cool. So we're all in agreement. Yep. Shall we uh, make a motion to request that the city council give direction to, can you have a motion for us, Amy? Uh, I think I just, uh, let's see what I say. Uh, would, would the city manager like to make a s supporting or, or opposite comment? Oh, I think there is potential significant challenges in much of it and its application, and that's all policy decisions for the council, right? So um, costing and retroactivity, retro application, um, you, know, um, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of challenges there. Um, nonetheless, those are things that are beyond your purview, and if this is something that you want to work on, you ask the council to do it, they give it back to you, and you build the best thing possible, knowing that um, the policy decision makers may chop Change. off pieces and parts or defer their implementation or, or other things, but I like the idea of, you know, starting with this group and building the, you know, the best thing you can. I think I talked to you earlier. I was in third grade when Haley's Comet um, came through um, town. We went to the old airport. Um, you know, I think every school in, you know, Grass Valley, Nevada City, um, went to the old airport with a whole bunch of telescopes. And when it comes back, that will be my great-grandchild in third grade. Um, and, you know, there's an opportunity to protect the ability to see that um, with the naked eye. If you don't do this, yeah, it's not, that's not going to be available. Um, so I think that there's powerful opportunity in front of you and build the best thing possible. Just know that, you know, the council has a different obligation than you to. And you can know. you spell that out once more? You said costing and what? Like What's that? Costing and what else? Retrofitting? Um, well, those are two big ones, but, you know, the, the actual ordinance and the reason you want to do it is different than the policy implementation to actually impose such a thing on the community. So, like, um, managing the implementation, is that kind of what you're No, talking? just any part of it, just okay. like anything else. We just adopted a new ordinance on um, vegetation management and defensible space, and that was two years in the making with a whole bunch of upset people at different <laughs> points in time on different committees and you know um, so there's there's a difference between you know um, building things towards a, a goal and actually uh, you know making law and mm. so you weren't here for the beginning of that initiative you were What's here that? what the the vegetation one because it's been you haven't been in place for two years right um, they were talking about it it just wasn't doing anything Yes, right. So um, I imagine that, that um, we could do better than that, that, that initial effort. Obviously, it went somewhere, so it did great, right? Um, what can we learn from how difficult that was that, that in terms of how we approach either integrating the community um, in shaping it or informing the committee as we go to solicit feedback? you know, what, any recommendations in that regard? I think, um, you know, having uh, multiple views of it, not just Identify something all the gets stakeholders. brought to you and yeah. you talk about it and you adopt it, but, um, you know, bring back the framework for discussion, invite, you know, the stakeholders, you know, bring the chamber, bring community members, bring astronomers mm -hmm. in to hear the varying viewpoints and uh, especially the dissenting opinions, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, We'll, and, and talk about this over the course of, you know, several meetings to refine it and get to a point and then, you know, let, um, you know, staff be, um, take a devil's advocate approach mm -hmm. um, to it from, you know, how can this, what are the policy implica impl implications for the council? Because like I said, there's, you know, anytime you say we're going to retroactively apply something yeah. To the community. Yeah. Right. There, are, like, there is a segment, it's, there's yeah. a large segment of this community oh, gonna that is going to fight you, even if they think this is the right thing to do. Well, most people just don't want to be told what to do. It's, right. Yeah. It's so simple. Yeah. 
Um, it has to be something that I think, like, again, back to what I was saying about the communication efforts from the beginning, I think it's really important to woo people as early as possible. But I think we keep, have to keep in mind that the, the goal, we're going to follow the directives of the dark sky requirements, right? Right, with the, with an actual we're goal, with, with the actual goal of becoming a dark skies place, but within within a phase of, to our community. Yeah, within a mm -hmm. but within a phase in period, and, and the, the the language for for that uh, that's in the Ridgeway ordinance doesn't seem so onerous. Well, yeah, uh, uh, Commissioner Brown pointed that out too. They don't. I don't think they. They didn't have a phase in. Time frame. They just yeah, that was. I didn't see that in there. Up, like, yeah. Yeah, there isn't, um, it does not apply to existing buildings unless they come in and change something. Which is different than the Dark Sky mm -hmm. Association right. guidelines. Which might be something like what Stuart Baker was saying, where you have to get, eight, you know, and so maybe sense. there's some sort of incentive to right. proactively become dark sky compliant without, you know, some architectural change to your building or whatever. Like so, so the folks who wouldn't be required to, if it was like existing, per the mm -hmm. Ridge, Ridgeway town or whatever. Maybe there's some way we can incentivize them that they want to. That, that was my thought, like with the fees yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Well, and, 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 and peer pressure and actually seeing results might be encouraging too. But, but uh, to, to, to stay focused, like unerringly on the, on the goal, um, will we'll get us there more than if we stop, if we're prepared to stop halfway there. I was thinking they'd just get a sticker on their window that they're like, I'm yeah. dark sky compliant. Yeah. Actually, one more point that I made to Amy, which forgot to bring up here, was the gas lights. I think yeah. that's another thing we need to discuss, yeah. too. Also, I think it's a huge benefit for the gas lights. I mean, if I mentioned this in my email to Amy, but if you've ever been downtown, when there's the not, out. when the power's up, there's yeah. not much yeah. good about a power outage, but dang, the downtown yeah, is gorgeous right. when yeah. the right. power is out. Yeah. It's really beautiful. And, and it's some, really some, beautiful. Some, some supporting documentation may be like photographs of, of of Broad Street when the power's out, but the gas lights are on. Yeah, and if the historic, you know, community, you know, gets behind it and things like that, I think it can be helpful too. If, if I may, Chair and I, um, the problem with that is almost certainly those will go away in the next five years. Um, oh. They are hogs of natural gas, uh. um, and they are not historical. Yeah. So those two things will almost certainly, the state will preempt and outlaw those kind of things, just like you're already seeing with electrification and um, you know, no natural gas, no additional natural gas connections and things like that. I'm and curious, I'm curious, curious how that, much it costs. And I'm month. certain that beautiful <laughs> LED retro forty thousand dollars a year, yes. It, 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 oh, I'm sure it was higher last month too. He probably spent that much. Sure. Yeah. But it's coming back down. I got a notice from PG&E. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm certain though that beautiful LED retrofits of those lights. Will be available or, or something doable. else because there we are. I mean, that's what's on Spring Street. We don't gas on Spring Street, right? Yeah, right. You, or you something else because the LED lights are actually not good for your health. That's well, so that's mean. actually that's not. Is that not true? That, it, Is it not, only based on the, the color temperature? It's the color temperature. It's, it's the, color temperature. The, the whole arguments around blue light and what they do to us are very like at least as far as blue light blockers go. Like that's absolutely out. Of course. For, Question, it's questionable. It's very questionable. You mean blue light glasses, Pseudo blo yeah. blocker glasses or yeah. something? Oh, just in general, yeah. I've read mixed studies on that. Like, there's a, the thing is with something like light and with blue light and with like any single causational argument like that. Like there are so many other things that are going on. Like to to argue that blue light is creating more stress in the midst of a pandemic. Oh like, no, I wouldn't assume that, that that's not that's a good example. study, but if somebody said 5,000 Kelvin light exposure versus 2,700 Kelvin light exposure, it's, that it's just really like hard to know without terrible. like really digging into like the, the primary literature and, hmm. it, they're, they're, and, they're, it, and it, as, as with all like pop science, it comes to us at the point where it's just been very yeah. um, purposefully edited by 
by various media sources. Yeah, people with <laughs> different agenda. So like, <laughs> there could be some truth to it, but like, I wouldn't, um, as someone who studied endocrinology, like, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, one is directly linked to our hormonal systems. There are many confounding variables. There, thank you. Yes, there are. <laughs> yes. And, and I'm not discounting it either. Like, I think it right. could certainly contribute. But Good to have um, your skill set at work. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to rain on your parade. It just, you know. It's that's your job. Yeah, 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 yeah that's that's your job. It might not even be there by the time yeah, we also, get to the tenure phases. Like, oh. yeah. <laughs> no, we, we need to hear these if, if we want to make this successful. There's also that's what the we need to bistro lights or whatever you call them across Commercial Street. The, Love them. Just, those are oh, the yeah. things on the list. Love them. That's another thing, yeah, we have to address. Yeah. But three forks, right? But these three forks ones are. Yeah. I didn't know that existed. But, but again, not, not non compliant lighting like the bistro lights, which I kind of like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're really neat. You know, they, they, yeah, they and they can also it. be turned off at 10 p.m. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. what, yeah, it's fine. And, and the Dark Skies the Dark Skies organization says that that just is what has to happen to non-compliant lighting. Yeah. Turn it off. Yeah, turn it off. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, let's see. Motion? And you guys can do a motion. I think if you just want to give me direction, right? I don't think I need a formal motion. Unless you guys really want to. Let's maybe assign a liaison to yeah. how we present. How They're all looking. No, only only Amy Cobb. All in favor? Is it because it's an all in favor thing? <laughs> all, in, all in favor of, of uh, asking the city council that. With the chair serving as the. Oh, yes. Yeah. I yeah. think we should have representation from. Yeah, the chair um, serving as a representative. Yeah, yeah I also. Uh, um, well, all in favor? Yeah. Or, aye. Or, aye. Oh, aye. 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 Commissioner or Chair Nye is going to assist me. If that, if that, if the, if the, if the commission agrees, yeah. That's included in the yes. Peter, we're not going yet. I would be happy to assist you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 As long we as can call ourselves as the long luminaires. as it's female so, candidates. I like it. I like it. No, the luminaires. Oh, All right. this is, we're still officially in a plan. Yeah, we're still yeah. we're still going. Um, we have a few more items, right? Um, liaison yes, reports. You know, yeah, liaison reports and future future agenda items. Liaison reports. With Any reports? future requested items at this time? Um, I should have agenda items? pinned down. Andy, while he was still here at Providence Mine Road. Um, Do you want to share about oh. where they should record on the agenda? Yes, so we were talking about, uh, I thought it would come up in the, when we were doing the discussion, but we, if this came up with a future, um, you know, as a future agenda item, there are several things that kind of come up. Uh, sometimes they come up uh, more often than other things that or things that are, you know, give you guys some problems um, and things we'd like to maybe change in the, the zoning code. So as we see those things, um, we can put them under the future agenda request items. And then, you know, once we build up a, a, enough one or two times a year, I can bring back to you guys um, a, uh, like a, a discussion item to put all those things on. It's you know, basically the same process. We'll take it to the council. But if there's just things that we want to see changed in the code because they're not really working for you guys, hmm. so things we kind of periodically see, we'll get, we can start generating a list of those things. So clarifying some of the historical guidelines or things like that, is that what you're saying? Not the guidelines, but things that are directly in the ordinance. I mean, well, we can do guidelines too. Like the tree, like we, I think we talked before about tree, tree removal, trees, like yeah. you know, allowing there to be staff approval of invasive species. There's probably some like, things in our sign ordinance yeah, that there's probably yeah. some yeah. things. <laughs> neon versus. I think that the intent of the having it as an agenda item for you would be at the end of every meeting, um, you could say, hey, you know, this issue came up, we've talked about it before, trees, you know, whatever it is, maybe takes note of it, it goes in your minutes, and then we don't lose sight of it. And then we bring back to you twice a year or once a year, um, all a list of all of those items and say, is this still an issue? Is it something you'd like it to 
the city council to consider providing direction to um, amend ordinances, that kind of thing, instead of just every six months from now we're gonna be like, yeah, the trees again, right? Yeah, um, exactly. So <laughs> it, it, you don't have to do this. This would just be an opportunity to to collect that information at each meeting um, and and to bring it back to you in a you know a, a presentation style at, a, at you know at a kind of a defined interval for your consideration. And, 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 and devote a chunk of, of, of meeting agenda to these various items, or, or would it also be, serve the purpose to uh, to to make a make an agenda item a request for a specific thing, and then we do it on the next at the next meeting. I think a chunk of time would be spent when we bring all of them back. So for discussion. To prioritize so just a, what we want to work just on. Just a quick, hey, this is something that we keep seeing. I'll put it on the list, and then we'll bring it back for discussion. You know, not probably the next meeting, but um, once we get we amass a, a number of them. Okay, but in the case of the, in the case of this dark skies initiative, it, it's 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 on the. This one, you guys. This was a specific ordinance you guys wanted to. Um, have as a discussion item. So that's still fine. If you wanted to, if there's a specific okay. yeah, there's no, no prohibition yeah. against doing yeah. it that way. Okay. Yeah. But I would tell you that we're not going to put something in front of the council every month from you guys. Okay. It's not practical. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's why. That's your version of helping us prioritize. Keeping, like, here's keeping track of it, yeah. talking about it once or twice a year, and then we can take it to the council, hey, here's, and that might be a good once your joint session of the two, the council's agenda is to listen to your presentation on, you know, the workings of the planning commission and your recommendations for ordinance adoptions, policy changes, things like that. Um, and, you know, so that it's structured, you know, it's coming, um, and um, instead of straining things along, you know, an urgent item or something that comes up that you think is really pressing, obviously. Um, but I don't want you to. I don't want to set out a realistic expectation that you could just try to feed the council something, you know, every other meeting. It's just not, you know, practical to do, um, nor do we have the staff capacity to, you know, have, I mean, uh, in my one year here, we did about 350% more ordinances than they did in the previous three years. Now it's during COVID, so they, you know, didn't have to do as much, but um, a lot of that was clean up. Um, so I just know that there is more cleanup to do, you know, um, so I don't want you to, think that we don't support you at the same time, not all of it can be done all at once. It's the, you know, kind of the... It doesn't seem like we have a huge number of things that we've been dying to oh. get to them anyway. I, I think the idea of having a list, so... Yeah, that sounds great. Because you're, you're exactly right, it's six months from now. Oh, yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. having that running list, I think... Because it'll be, idea. we're not, it'll be 10 years until the next cash in field gets built, and then Peter's going to call me and say, are cutting down trees is that in their yeah. plan? And we're like, we're supposed to have talked about that 10 years ago. <laughs> On a Saturday. Yes. <laughs> and he answered. <laughs> so the process we can expect going forward, uh, um, let's see, the process we can expect going forward then is, is, is some uh, a draft ordinance to be, well. Are you talking about the so, but the, the so the so the city council no the city you know, regarding this so the city council will 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 hear this whenever it will fit onto their agenda um, this request it should be a quick item and then and then you'll draft an ordinance yes. and and, and I'll bring it back yeah. whenever you get it yeah. there mm -hmm. yeah Pretty straightforward okay. and that will be a public hearing so we will do um, a greater outreach yeah. y'all specifically reach out to. And some in, and then some input from from uh, uh, Brian McAllister is important because yeah. city-owned lighting is part of an ordinance, uh, at least according to the Dark Skies Association. Um, you know, like a, a reasonable phase-in process there. Um, um, are there any uh, uh, liaison reports? You're gonna, I think you're going to add on the ones that are missing. I don't think they used to. Did, didn't I add it on? I didn't get the update. Oh. I downloaded it, and mine did not have the Nevada City Winery. Did, I, did you update it after I, that? I might have updated it after that. Yeah. yeah sorry. Because <laughs> that one came in at the very end. So I updated it, and then I updated it again. I updated it with the liaison reports, and then I updated it with the 
sign up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So if there's nothing else, we can adjourn.